are uh, actually, if you compare Europe, USA and China, we do have uh, among this pool, almost 50% of the, of the AI papers that have been published. However, let's take a little, another look. Number of top AI researchers, uh, the top 10% uh, age index uh, researchers, you see that uh, uh, United States is, is, uh, the, the, uh, is uh, coming closer. But if you look at number of AI articles in Elsevier, uh, you will also see that uh, China is, uh, is also uh, getting closer. But look here, number of top AI researchers, AI researchers publishing in the top academic conferences, then uh, Europe is, uh, is uh, um, well, uh, takes a, a smaller, a smaller uh, percentage, uh, smaller uh, part of that. And then number of AI startups per country. Well, look at that. Uh, while Europe is doing very well in number of AI researchers, it does not do so well if you only look at turning research into innovation. So in short, this is the trend from research all the way down to, uh, to actually creating new companies AI-driven companies. That, that's a trend that is unfortunate, uh, and we have to look why. Well, and, but maybe we should first ask the question, why is this important? Well, first of all, it's, it's important for science. Good AI research is dependent on good AI innovation. Uh, research very seldom really lives in a bubble, and a strong, AI ecosystem in Europe will create a stronger scientific AI community in, 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 in Europe. Uh, the other reason why this is important, and this is very, very obvious, technology defines our reality. It, tells, it defines how we work, what we talk about over dinner, how we play with our children, who we vote for, what we believe in. So, well, Europe should not leave that definition of our future reality entirely to others. We need to take more of a command in moving this forward. Look at this, most innovative countries in 2019, uh, the Bloomberg Index and the Global Innovation Index. Well, Europe has six of the top 10 most innovative countries in the world. They have, or seven, if you look at the Global Innovation Index. So how come, what, what is this, why do we have so many strong innovative countries and we are not turning it into to, to, to actually value driven and value creating uh, entrepreneur companies? What, what is happening here? And if you then take a look at the Nordics, such a, in number of people, such a small part of the world, uh, they have three of the top 10 most innovative countries in the world. But there is a, an issue here because in those lists, they are counting input indicators like, uh, like the number of uh, proportion of the population who has high, higher education, uh, legal system, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and of course, Europe is doing pretty well on the input indicators. And Norway is a typical example: great on input indicators, but really poor on turning it into real value. If you only look at in output indicators, it's a completely different story. So we have an issue here. Europe is very good at all the input indicators, but does not do not create the value we need to see. There are, this is a problem, and we have five challenges in Europe. Maybe there's an outdated thinking about how innovation works. There is fragmentation uh, in, in, across Europe. We don't, we, 
we have a lot of excellent scientists that works that are spread all over the continent and do and sits pretty much alone or in small groups and do not collaborate very tightly with industry or with other parts of the ecosystem. We have an immature data market. If data is the raw material for, the, for a part of the AI driven uh, innovation industry, well, what, how well does that raw material market function? And of course, where are the European beacons? And number five, where is the political emphasis on moving this forward? Where does talk turn into action? These are five challenges in Europe. And I think my time is up. Uh, so I will leave it with that for now. For this insight, and I'm looking forward to discuss more in detail during the panel afterwards. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Simon Greenman, who is representing UK. Simon is a co-founder and partner at Best Practice AI, where he advises corporate startups, startups and investors on best practice in AI strategy, implementation, risk and governance. He is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global AI Council and he has over 20 years of international digital transformation and innovation leadership experience, including co-founding MacQuest.com, the first online mapping brand. Simon chairs the Harvard Business School along the Angels of London, is an AI year at Seedcamp, an advisor at BN Capital. He holds an MBA from Harvard and a BA in Computing and Artificial Intelligence from the University of Sussex. Thanks a lot for being with us, Simon. The virtual stage is yours. Yes, apologies, slight technical challenge here. Be there very shortly. Okay. Okay, can you see my slides? Very good. Well, very interesting lead in from Morton. Pleasure to be here this afternoon. My name is Simon Greenman from Best Practice AI in the UK. We're an AI management consultancy. And I probably have a bit of a more optimistic view on Europe um, in that we have a lot of potential. And in particular, the UK, we believe we have a lot of potential. And the UK has stood really at the crossroads of AI globally for quite some time. And AI is obviously nothing here, but the UK has really been at the crossroads from a sort of cultural, technical, linguistic, societal, and historic perspective for AI. And we very much believe that we can continue with that. Now, as, as Deep Mind said, there was no better place than London to build their hub. Um, many people told them that they, a new AI lab would need to be based in Silicon Valley to be successful but they saw things differently. They wanted the diversity in society, the skills, the multicultural, the global minded, and that's why they chose London in the UK there. But as, as we look towards the sort of the UK more broadly, we need an overall ecosystem to make sure that AI can germinate, grow, be successful. And there's a number of things that really need to come together, and Morton touched upon those. You know, firstly, skills and talents. Um, Element AI ranked UK number three on skills and talent. And you see some of the faces here are really some of the historic pioneers of A AI from Ada Lovelace to Turing to Maggie Bowden, Jeffrey Hinton, um, Dennis Hazaby. And you know we see again and again in the UK, major US tech companies, big tech companies coming to base their organizations here. Facebook just opened a third London office with a hundred new AI roles. DeepMind lost over a billion 
pounds cumulatively on their AI offices here in London, where they've got over a thousand researchers, some of the best brains. And then the UK as government's looking to invest in over a thousand students in PhDs in various dedicated centers. Um, and then China, we're seeing investing in the UK, looking to get access to our technologies and companies. So a strong base of skills and talent, but this is backed up also as part of the ecosystem in the research. Some of the leading universities you can see here, Oxford, Edinburgh, Cambridge, UCL, Imperial, some fantastic AI research centers. And the, according to Tortoise Media AI Index, which is a fantastic index ranking various countries on AI around the world, Britain boasts the, Britain boasts the highest number of top rated centers for AI research of any nation. And then we look at the overall sort of government strategy, and there's a very strong commitment to put UK at the forefront of the AI and data revolution. And we see investments of over a billion dollars in the sector deal for AI. And very much in tune with Europe, the UK wants to become the world leader in ethical AI. And we see that in some of the institutions it builds, governments appoint new board to lead welfare center for the data ethics and innovation institute. We really want to lead in that. And it's funding a lot of PhDs here. So it's very strong government strategy and institutional support to go with that. But that's great. We've got support. We've got, we've got um, talent. We've got research. But how do we actually turn that into value? And if we look at sort of investment supply and demand across the UK, we see that aside from the US, the UK is the largest, is home to the largest number of AI companies and startups. And I think in London, there was a report two years ago that talked about a thousand AI startups. And I'm very involved in that with some of the work I do with CCAMP and other incubators. We also see, great, we've got companies, we're started, lots of startups, but there needs to be demand. We need to turn that AI creation into value in enterprise companies and like. And so we've seen strong demand across many sectors. Uh, in particular, finance is very strong in the UK, healthcare, Security, we've got some great cybersecurity applications. And then we, behind all of this is a very strong investment ecosystem from bench catalysts. In 2019, about 2.4 billion pounds is put into AI companies in the UK, which places us at number three or four. And behind all of this is also a very strong regulatory environment, infrastructure and public support as well. So overall, we believe that the UK is really positioned well for the future. And the future is gonna get a lot more complicated. We're really seeing something of a fracture of the world's technology ecosystems into very much the big tech libertarian AI companies of the US, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Facebooks, the Amazons. The nature of China with a massive 1.4 billion population is allowing them to really focus on national scale challenges for that populace. Security, surveillance, healthcare, uh, legal, transportation, massive AI problems. But there is a fracture as we can see coming between these two countries and we will likely see two massive ecosystems. And then third, Europe sits bang in the middle of this and we've really got to focus on citizen first AI, human centric AI, protecting the individual. We need responsible, trustworthy AI. And we believe that Europe, UK can play a very important role in continuing to being at the crossroads, especially as this world fractures and balkanized into different AI ecosystems here. And our role will be historic. Um, and we believe that we have the opportunity to really bridge between these. The big wild card for the UK is obviously Brexit. But we are hoping that after Brexit, we will continue to reach out and work with the world's technology and AI ecosystems. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Simon. It's really interesting to see how strong we actually are in Europe. And one thing that we will elaborate a little bit more is what you just mentioned is about the human-centric AI. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our Swiss presenter, <laughs> Andy, Andy. Fitte, who is also my co-founder of Swiss Cognitive. Besides that, he is also the president of the Swiss IT Leadership Forum, has a vast experience in IT, used to be CIO of uh, different enterprises, and 
was awarded in 2015 to the Swiss CAO of the Year. Besides that, Andy holds a degree in electrical engineering and an executive MBA from the University of St. Gallen. He is a professional skipper. And this leads me to how he is also navigating Switzerland with all of us together in this AI wave. Andy, it's my pleasure to give you the virtual stage to represent our country. Thanks a lot, Dolich. I will show you what we do in Switzerland. Uh, here, here with, uh, in our studio. Um, just give you some brief insight of what's going on in Switzerland. And I really great to have this line from Nordic, uh, Norway and UK. And we will hear some other insights from Israel and France, and later on a panel with all of them. That's really great. So I give you some, uh, some insights. So first question to all of you is, is AI really magic? And I have um, for you a quote from our uh, chancellor in Switzerland. And let's just listening in. No one rightly knows what is meant by artificial intelligence. My favorite definition is still that artificial intelligence is the art of making computers that behave like the ones in movies. Hmm? Sorry. Um, uh, sorry, who can hear me? No, there are nothing. Okay, fine. Let's go ahead. Um, so here we can hear um, is not magic AI, but the one point is really that we have 90% done of technology, algorithm, concept for AI, but all the 90% to go ahead is the question, do we have the right culture? Do we have the, the investment, the VCs? Do we have the framework in the environment? Do we have the ecosystem around of us? Do we have the pleasure to do something extraordinary with AI? And I have to say, as an engineer, 90% is almost done technically, but to do the other stuff, to bring this on the market, it's hard work to do. And let's go to the latest, the, uh, the last 90%. So in Switzerland, we love valleys and we have a lot of them. And that's natural like Silicon Valley or all the valleys and cognitive valleys. So we love to, to invite technology to us. For the strange combination between nature, these heavy mountains and technology, and we love to combine this. And that's our passion. Why is this our passion? Because Switzerland is here without any natural resources. Yeah, exactly. Can no. you please, yeah. Sorry, just a second. Okay. Uh, here we have Switzerland. We do not have natural resources. We really stick to the idea that we have to use our own brain. And this is here in this sentence very um, briefly here that we need to innovate ourselves over and over again. So we have pretty the same sites like Silicon Valley. And so Switzerland is a tiny little town at the end that we can really oversee if you are it establishing or something that really means that Switzerland. So we don't believe in any towns or certain areas. So we really believe in Switzerland and having this in mind if we grow together. So we are not only this little tiny Switzerland, we also on top of different um, um, lists and especially the European region list last year, 
with 280 and 38 regions since in Europe, not only in the European Union, in Europe, we belong to the five of the 10 top one. And that's really a, a strong science, not only for AI, for all the technology that's living in Switzerland and come later on in the, in the slides. Here are some other tops um, that we have in it, European artificial intelligence top, and another one, so it really means also in the university where we are really on the first place. Uh, coming to business, we have a long history with, with different um, research center and global uh, tech companies. Like IBM are with us since a long time, uh, around 50 years, Google, Disney, Research in Zurich, so really a cool environment to grow and also to establish the best technology for the world market. Here are some other numbers uh, belonging to, um, to the Swiss market. Here you can see, especially also on the bottom left, global nonprofit UN has established their headquarters for AI for good in Geneva. So this means a lot also in the question of trust for us. So that's really great. So I coming to, a, to end and a very, very special format to show how we would like to perform in Switzerland. We believe that AI is a kind of infrastructure for drones, for robotics, for AI, uh, IoT, for the manufacturing and so on for energy so that we can really bring these different topics together and, and bring the strength to the market. So that's from my side. And, and I would like to hand over to, to you, Dalit. And uh, let's start with the panel. Thanks, Thanks a, lot. a lot. First, First I, I would like, like although, although we tested, tested uh, several, several times, times, for whatever, for whatever reason, reason, we can't, we can't get, get data 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 from, from in. in. I'm, I'm so, so sorry. sorry. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, I would, I would like, like to introduce you quickly to Gali, because perhaps you will be able, able to join the panel where we started, started already. already. Otherwise, Otherwise, we will have an interview with her later on. Gaëlle Fison joined the France Hub for AI as a general manager one year ago, fully aligned with her ambition to develop a European AI model for business and society. She started her career in the Prime Minister Administration data dedicated to the stage planning, dealing with clusters and innovation policies. She was then responsible for the digital project of the new Metro Grand Paris Express with Minister Christian Blanc when, she law was dropped, when the law was drafted. Later in the implementation phase at Société du Grand Paris, where she initiated the data project. She also created a startup, a long time digital archiving based on glass. She is always keen in strongly promoting European project, including French, German ones. And it would be really cool if we managed to get you in, Gael. We're struggling with the tech. And unfortunately, this is still something that it's not solved forever. Now, I would like to start with the panel. And if we will get Gael in, we just do it spontaneously. One thing that was mentioned a few times is how good Europe is in different things, in research, in innovation, in patents. Now, Morton, you said there is actually a lack of European beacons. What do you mean by that? Can you emphasize, please? Morgan, can you hear me? Well, sure, I can do that. Um, if you look at um, if you look at the 
yes, I can. And I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. So um, if you if you look at the um, Right, I'm trying again. So, yes, thank you so much. I'm trying again. So, uh, if you look at the a number of companies in, uh, if you if you think about what is often called uh, internet companies, the world largest internet companies by valuation, if you want, or by uh, revenue, if you just list them up, uh, starting with Apple at the top, Amazon number two, Alphabet number three, and you keep on listing them up and listing them up and you get down to the 20 largest. There's not a single European company there. Uh, so um, uh, they, 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 they are, Europe has a lot of very interesting technology companies of various sizes, but we don't have the real engines, the real motors anymore. The, the Olivetti in Italy, Bull in France, uh, Nokia in Finland, where are they? Uh, the other thing I'm also concerned about is that we don't have, we don't have um, the type of beacon lighthouse for, for AI research. Uh, and that's why, as, as uh, some of you know, I'm, um, I'm one of the co-founders of CLEAR, uh, uh, which is the Confederation of Laboratories of AI Research in Europe. And one thing we are concerned about is exactly this. Quite a few uh, researchers in, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, they go to the States. And they go to the States not for the money. They go to the States because of the opportunities, because of the opportunities of working fascinating teams on fascinating projects. So we believe that Europe needs to create something similar. And Europe has the means to do that if it can cooperate. Uh, Europe need, can establish a lighthouse research center, scientific center, like a CERN for AI, like Switzerland has CERN. And just forget about the particle accelerator, but the researchers come and go. They stay there for three months, six months, 12 months, two years, and go back to their research labs and collaborate and, and bring and spread the competence at the same time being available to, to work on particular uh, exciting projects in collaboration. Europe needs that and Europe can create that, but Europe doesn't do that today. Yes, that's true. It's not only with regards to research, it's also with regards to startup companies and we're keeping saying we can, but the question is how are we doing it? And Simon, listening to these words, and you said that one of the best sectors within AI in the UK is financial industry and cybersecurity. Just cut off. I'll just repeat quickly. Can you hear me, Simon? Yes, you were just saying financial, one of the leading sectors was financial. Yeah, so looking at UK, and you mentioned that the financial sector and cybersecurity sectors are one of the leading AI sectors in the UK. Listening to what you said, how would you emphasize, what are the biggest challenges for the growth for AI in UK, especially in the sectors where you're strong anyway? Yeah, and, and Martin's points aren't, aren't lost on me, um, but I also think we need to start from something of an optimistic base as well. Um, but you know, we take something like the venture capital industry and we go back 10 or 15 years ago and there really wasn't much of an ecosystem in, in London, the UK for venture capital. Fast forward today and we have 20, 30 uh, unicorns. So we've got to really look at things in terms of trajectory. Um, if you look to sort of the US and China, and I will come back to your question, you look at the US, well, they, they are a magnet for talent. Um, some of the best researchers, they also have DARPA, they, which funds a huge amount of the sort of fundamental primary research. And then they've got a lot of demand as well. So they have fundamental research, great research talent, funding and demand, which creates really a, a virtuous circle at scale. 
And then you look to China, which is doing some amazing things in AI. The demand is off the charts. You have a population of 1.4 billion. So every time you have some great AI algorithms, the demand in apply at scale is absolutely huge. So the real challenge for the UK and Europe at the end of the day is we've got a lot of the core ingredients, we've got research, we've got some good VC investment, um, we have talent, but how do we create scale? And Europe has traditionally struggled to build technology software companies at scale. And it's the same, it's same here. So what we need to do is make sure there's demand and frankly, that there's re that corporates and enterprises adopt AI. Let's get a massive marketplace for AI in Europe and use our homegrown AI technology. So scale is a key issue here. Could I add uh, to this? Sure, sure. Um, so, so, yes, I completely agree. This is very interesting. Uh, we ha you, Simon was, was saying that we have all the ingredients. What I was uh, commenting on in my introduction was that we have so much, you're so good at the ingredients. And then for some reason, the output is not as strong as it should be given the in ingredients. So there is some sand in the machinery. The innovation ecosystem is, has sand in it. And you know, this is a great situation to be in. It's not like we have to build up. Yeah, we do have to build up ecosystems, but we already have a lot in place. So figuring out how to get the sand out is, is, is something that should be our priority. And we do see you do see pockets of strong innovation across Europe. London is an example. Uh, Stockholm, uh, Helsinki, Copenhagen are Nordic examples. Uh, but we still see that we can get more out of it, much more. And that is what, I, what I'm focusing on. And I, I would like to emphasize, this is really a good situation. It's not a bad situation. We have the components but we need to put them together in a better way. Absolutely. Perhaps, Perhaps Andy, you can give us your view on how can we bridge, on one hand, the knowledge and all the prerequisites that you guys just mentioned, they are here. We just need to use it, we have to develop, and we have actually to implement it, make something out of it. How do you see how we can bridge it, on one hand, within Europe, and on the other hand, also, how can we scale this up then globally? Um, who are you asking first? Go ahead. That's, that's probably you. That's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the question to me. Just, just giving you uh, here also my, my meaning. It's, it's, uh, European Union is, is, is organizing themselves with an AI strategy, first of all. On the other hand, they are fragmented in, 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 in different markets uh, in Europe. So if we go to the strategy for AI in Europe, uh, I mean the European Union, uh, based on their activity in 2018, there was a strong agreement that this should be lined on the data protection, privacy, ethical questions, and all the stuff that no one else is doing. That's good, probably, I will have to say, probably good for Norway, for Morton, good for Switzerland, to have a special purpose vehicle to run an economy. But if we're talking about a, a global stage economy like European single digital market, I can't believe that they are really believing that it will be a driver with data protection and so on. It's of course, this has to be done and has to be a focus. But in the meantime, the race goes on with investment in large question of how we can use data for our business. And this investment goes just away or was uh, going away from, uh, from Europe. During the time that Europe has talk, was talking about how we can protect ourselves in the question of how we're using data in business. 
So this is my strong belief that's good for smaller countries like Switzerland or also Norway or some other ones to believe and also to stand up and hold the flag of data protection and for global policy making, but not for a market place like Europe. And this uh, with my, my previous reader, uh, like Simon Morton, I'm totally with you. We have all the gears with us, but some sand in it, isn't it? So Morton, maybe you can add here some things. Uh, I have two comments. I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure whether uh, it makes any difference between you're a small country or or a large economy at all. I don't think that makes the difference. I do believe though that uh, any any market that is developing around a raw material uh, requires. And and you look at uh, national policies for data 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 policies, and uh, the Commission. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an assumption that uh, we should make it easier for, uh, there's an enormous production of, of data and if it's produced privately, it's owned by that private companies, but there's a lot produced by governments. And then there is in the Nordics at least, a strong focus on, 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 on making sure that this data is available, available for companies uh, and entrepreneurs to create value from in addition to whatever the government, gov uh, government uh, institutions are, are generating this data for. But, whole, but that's, that's not going to happen because if you, you cannot build an, a, a thriving um, uh, activity around a raw material if there is not, if the producer of the raw material cannot guarantee steady, high quality delivery and whether, and you also need the data factories, you need companies that can uh, take the raw materials and turn it into something you can use it for. And, and in order for that to work, there needs to be a, a, a working raw material market, meaning data market. And that means that money has to flow. Money has to flow down to the producer of the data in a different way than it does, does today particularly if that producer of the data is, an, is a governmental agency. There is no way they, a governmental agency suddenly can become a fully professional data provider to a, to a commercial market without there being a flow of money. So that I, I consider this the main challenge now in, in some of the ideas around creating a data-driven economy, in the, at least in the Nordic, is that there is a bit of a naivete when it comes to what, how a market should function. Money needs to flow in a market for it to function. Mm -hmm. And then you get the problem that who's going to create, who's asking for this data? Well, often that's entrepreneurs, startups that don't have that much money. So there is a market failure. So where the government needs to put in their, their support is to the startups so that they can pay for a steady uh, stream of data that is refined. Thanks a lot, Morten. I can see in your face. <laughs> can, you, can you give us some feedback on how AI is being regulated in the UK? How do you see that? How it's what in the UK? How is AI regulated in the UK and what is your opinion? on? Yeah, and, and this, this is a really important topic. And one of the strategic differentiators that, that Europe and the UK has gone for that is our citizens uh, have something of a fundamental human right around data privacy and control over their data and data sovereignty. And so that obviously came out in 2018 GDPR with things like um, right to forget, to get rid of my data from Google, tell me what's, where my data is as well. But the same sort of concepts uh, and principles are, are being thought about by the European Commission with regards to AI. So allowing users greater control over their use of data and, and their use of data in AI. So for example, rights should be things like um, uh, transparency, accountability, explainability um, of decisions and the like. So um, that's, that's an important, important area. But what, what's really interesting is 
and people don't know this, is GDPR actually regulates AI at the moment. So the Information Commissioner's Office, which regulates GDPR in the UK, there's actually a clause in there that says if any company has a decision with a fully automated decision with legal effects. So for example, if my system um, decides to employ you or not employ you automatically or credit or something like that, then it's important um, to give explanations for that. And so the regulation's already starting, but we just need to be careful that at the same time, it doesn't encumber innovation. We need innovation. Can you hear? Yes. Yeah. So that, that's my thoughts on the UK. Thanks a lot. Now, oh, Gael. <laughs> Bonjour. Can you hear me? Gael? Hello? Gael, you seem to be on mute. At least we managed to get her in. Tech just letting us down this time, but Go ahead. that's okay. Gael, as soon as you can hear, try to get into the discussion. Will be our great pleasure. So we were just like elaborating on the regulation and the policy on AI. Uh, I would like to go a little bit towards what you mentioned at the beginning about all the chances, the prerequisites that we have, all the innovation startups, and how actually we, can we really turn this into money? How can we make sure that the researchers, as well as the innovators, the startups, with, uh, remained with us in Europe and are not leaving towards the US. What can we do to give them a perspective to make sure that we can build a strong ecosystem and a welfare within Europe, especially now during the crisis? I think it's even much more important to make sure that we build a strong Europe together. The question is open. If Gael can hear us, it will be great to have your insight from France. We really turn this into money. How can we make sure that the researchers, as well as the innovators, the startups, with, uh, remain with us in Europe and are not leaving towards the US? So the question what can we do to give them a perspective to make I sure that we can build a strong ecosystem and, and a welfare within Europe, especially now during the crisis, Simon, I think it's like even much more to, what can to we make do sure that we build sure a strong we Europe together. All the startups and the researchers the question is open. remain in Europe and build a strong ecosystem and a strong from, economy. We really turn this into money how can we make sure that the researchers as well as the innovators the startups with uh, remain with us in europe and are not leaving towards the us so the question what can we do to give them a perspective to make I sure still, that we um, can build okay so that was the most amazing delay i've heard in my life but but uh, maybe I can jump in. Because we're in Switzerland. Uh, except you. So okay, the product. Okay, should I jump in? Okay, Definitely. absolutely yes, because uh, I need to choose between. Uh, I need to listen to to you through uh, through Zoom. Uh, yes, I think uh, I I mentioned that earlier. I most most um, people don't defect to the US if you want because of money. They defect because of opportunity. And what we have seen over the last year, and Simon mentioned this, we have seen a tremendous increase in number of startups, in number of uh, uh, universities uh, providing, uh, establishing entrepreneur schools, uh, courses and, uh, and, and study programs that are entrepreneurial oriented instead of innovation oriented. Uh, um, we see more and more collaboration and interest uh, in, univers in universities to act on the third role, the direct role to where 
where you're focusing on the direct uh, um, uh, response that you, you have as an institution to the society around you. So we see a growth and we see just count the number of, of, of deals that are being made over the last uh, four years and you see this curve. However, still there are some things that are lagging behind and, and it's interesting. I think one thing that is lagging behind a bit uh, in many places in Europe is that we often tend to re, uh, end up with a, lit, a little bit of an old fashioned thinking about how innovation works. Innovation is not a linear push process where the universe sits up in an ivory tower and do the research and then hands the results over to a very grateful industry that turns it into to, to products and, and values. That is not how innovation happens. This is a classic triple helix, uh, but the reality is that today, the reason what we, we are using the word innovation ecosystem more and more is that ecosystems give an impression that it's complex, interrelated. There are at least five components in that ecosystem, government, academia, and universities, um, uh, businesses, entrepreneurs, and capital investors. And you see that uh, innovation happens in complex interactions between them. So when we, when we continue to talk about technology transfer of, of, of uh, offices, when we continue to, to think about and uh, talk about how academia should collaborate with industry, you're stuck in this old thinking. And unfortunately, some of the realization of how entrepreneurship is actually happening means that tight um, geographic uh, placements of all the components in the ecosystem needs to be there. So in Norway, for instance, uh, the capital of Norway, Oslo, does not have a technology university. It must be only capital in, in Europe that doesn't have it. And most of the technology uh, students, because in Norway, all of the universities are, are, are governmental, the government basically decides how to uh, distribute students and the technology students are placed in a, in a city with hardly any technology companies. You know, uh, it doesn't happen by itself. You need to put the components of the ecosystems together to make it work. You need to have coffee together. And that is part of how we can create the exciting environment where young people and entrepreneurs don't go to the States to, to feel excitement. Well, the Martin, excitement just, is I'd like home. to ask you here a question. Yes, do that. Um, how, how would you do the first step? So very practically, what could be a real first step for you all? Well, um, um, well, the, 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 the European Union, the Commission is planning on using uh, maybe a billion euros on a PPP, a public-private partnership, which basically is funding, uh, uh, bringing traditional uh, incumbents together with government and uh, researchers. I think this kind of models needs to be expanded. Basically, national AI strategies and national innovation strategies needs to stop uh, funding only these type of connections. They need to make sure that you bring in more components and you need to work on putting incubators, entrepreneurs, uh, investors, uh, acad academia, close as close as possible to each other. And you know, it's happening many places, but there's many places it, don't, it doesn't happen. And there's a lot of opportunity here. Yeah, can I can I add to that as well? I mean, I, I I joke a little bit about that people don't go to the America for for researchers for the money. Though, though I did spend about 13, 15 years living and working in the states, and it was definitely the money. Um, but but that actually the money doesn't matter as much in the UK 
because somebody like a deep mind, they are paying US salaries. If you, there's a thousand employees at, at deep mind and basically the average salary is well north of 300,000 euros ago. But, but in all seriousness, researchers, the best world-class researchers want to be where the other best world-class researchers are. They want to be surrounded by the best and the brightest. And that's what the US has been very good at doing is providing a cluster and density of researchers and research institutes. But look, the world's got some really big problems at the moment, sustainability, aging, you know, um, we've obviously seen it in the pandemic as well. There's some really big problems that we are very well suited to solve here. Norwegian, obviously, in sustainability, oil and gas, uh, moving into new forms of power. You know, we've got clusters and densities of financial services in London. So what we really need to think about is how do we create density and cluster here? And, you know, you can see in the U.S. what they actually do is, is specialize um, around New Jersey as pharmaceutical, Los Angeles movies and entertainment. The Valley is a bit of everything. Um, you go D.C. as politics. You look around the states, they've got lots of clusters specializing in different areas. Why can't we do the same? Make really world class clusters. Take the CERN idea for physics and do it in for environmental sustainability problems. Create very good research centers fund them with a long-term view and become a magnet for talent. And that will create a virtuous circle arm if we can do that. Yep, I completely agree. So, uh, and I also think that, uh, uh, if you just look at, uh, just look at uh, the, the budget for, for the next seven year uh, funding cycle for the European, for the commission, for the European Union. Uh, there is, a, I think, less than 1% that goes to digital Europe and, and the, the digital uh, approach. 24% goes to, for, uh, to, to the farming industry and, and, and so on. You know, so so uh, I do believe there is funds there. I do believe Europe can do this if they want, but I do believe it doesn't have to cost that much. I just believe it has to do with changing the way you're thinking. And one thing, uh, one way you have to change your way of thinking is, you know, um, first of all, put, make sure that your in, the incentives are such that these components we are talking about by themselves are searching together, finding their space in 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 the clusters and in the in, in innovation ecosystem, mm -hmm. in, but also. Look at the incentives in academia. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, uh, if I go to my scientists and ask them to participate in this, uh, this very exciting uh, regional program or, 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 or um, uh, working with these, uh, these startups, they would say, um, how would that make me full professor? And I would say, I'm not sure it would. I mean, it would take time away from your paper production and you might reap the benefits of it later but it will probably delay it mm -hmm. this is a problem we are we have um i think we have a million phd students in europe mm -hmm. and they they are being trained to do something different at least 20 percent of them should be rigged a little bit differently they should we should be able to to spend some of this money to do something in addition to what we already are doing as scientists namely uh, rig the incentive system so more of the scientists and researchers who would like to go in that direction can do that without being penalized. Yeah, I think that's right. And you do, what you see in the States is very good is between academia and business is the ability to really spend time between the two. And you know, one of the things that the AI focused academics really appreciate about the corporate environment is the access to the underlying infrastructure in terms of computational power. You know, we were actually talking to, to a PhD student at UCL, fantastic, one of the best, well, world's best universities around uh, for AI, especially natural language processing. And the, the student would run a uh, new AI algorithm and model, and it would take a, um, a week to run that model. Um, hop over the road to DeepMind, um, log on to your Google Compute Power, and those models are taking, well, hours, not days, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And also the size of the data, data sets that you can get in in corporate world is just absolutely yeah. massive. 
So I think a way to balance between the two and set up a structure, as you say, in alignment, to keep them in academia, but also allow them to have access to sort of state of the art and, and a wider perspective in the business world is, is really important here. But as you say, academia is all about publish or peril at the end of the day. But at the same time, you know, something like a deep mind research institute, why can't we have the European Deep Mind Institute? Um, and the UK is attempting to do that with things like the Turing Institute and things. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of potential. I, I, I'm not, I, I am optimistic. I, I started out very much less than optimistic a few years ago. I am optimistic too. There's a lot happening. And I do believe we should, we should mix this up so more people do in, innovate or perish also in academia. Mm -hmm. So I, I, really, I really believe there is a change happening, but it's slow. We would like to accelerate it because it's important. And as I was saying, one reason it is important is that technology defines our reality. Mm. Technology will define how we run our, uh, uh, our societies, what we discuss over, over dinner. And we really need to do more of it ourselves. I absolutely agree and would really like to jump into it. Obviously, research is a very important part of the whole ecosystem. But looking at the startups, looking at the, at the enterprises, there is also the other side. And what I just realized on this panel, as well as a lot of others that we're participating, we're remaining discussing the same topics and we're actually even have the same view on it. I'm still looking for how can we turn this into real value? And one of the things, and perhaps Andy, you can share these things with the others, is one of the things that I would say Switzerland is doing very good is the PPP, the private-public partnership, where we bring together academia, universities, with the enterprises. And I think this is what we need also to emphasize even more and turn it to, to real business. Um, no, I'm throwing that to Simon. I take it to me. No, the reason I didn't hear the last part of, of your question. So uh, that's why. Yeah, I, can repeat the question. I heard, I, I didn't hear yeah. all of it as well. Sorry. I, I did. Um, would I would like to emphasize a little bit more now in the last few minutes is yes. about the private public partnership. It's yeah. not all about research, it's a very interesting and a very fundamental part of the whole thing. But on the other hand, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. It's that makes on sense. The echo. It's on the yeah, so, so so I mean, a great example of that is in the UK. Now, we talked a lot about data, data sharing, data trust, data economics, data demand and marketplace. But one, one of the key, the key to AI, and it's a cliche, is that data is the new oil. Without data and good quality and data at scale, um, you've really got no interesting AI models. But what data sets do we actually have that are really interesting? And in the UK, as, as in many European countries, we have a national health service. And what we've got is fantastic longitudinal data on patients. And we have a lot, it's a gold mine of being able to do sort of predictive modeling, predictive analytics around what situations will cause disease. What are the likely predictors of disease? So the government um, looking at the National Health Service data in cooperation with the private sector on how to create um, and frankly, monetize um, the, the data. Now there's lots of issues about privacy of data um, and sovereignty of data, we're not gonna get into that. But for example, Google DeepMind worked, um, just launched in conjunction with the National Health Service at the Moorfield Hospital in London, um, tools to be able to detect um, retinal eye diseases. And you know that that's absolutely fantastic. Um, combining the best of the brains of DeepMind with the valuable data here. Now, we want to see more of those types of cooperations. I'd much rather it was a UK company that was developing those algorithms, so that the value of the UK company, uh, the UK company has that value. But those are examples where I think public-private cooperation can can greatly create value for 
um, enterprises and for society. I would also add to you, that, uh, add to you Morton, just a second. Yes. Uh, I think it's, uh, I will, you know, we are advising many large corporates and mid-sized corporates. Most of the corporates that would like to invent for them AI, all the concept of deep learning, machine learning, data scientists activity in their environment, mostly because they would like to have more efficiency, yeah. efficiency, more cost efficiency, maybe a bit growth. Mm -hmm. But that's not, that's not what, how we can win this race. We have to focus more on new market, a new market combined with technology that we have here, like technology with AI combined, give us, us even if we have now a local market, we have now a possibility of a global market access. And that's absolutely new. Forget about having some efficiency program together with data scientists and best technology in AI gives you just a few points, a few uh, percentage of using the potential in AI for your market. But if you think out, out of the box, in growth, in new technology with smart product and services, gives you a global access to your market. And that's absolutely new. That has nothing to do with better ERP system or better archive or a better this or this is absolutely a new story. And I see so many, most of them, investing in, in efficiency instead of growth. I can jump in first, uh, Simon. <laughs> I am, uh, I, I am I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that because uh, it is an inherent challenge here uh, because uh, public-private partnerships are dependent on uh, a private partner or a set of private partners that have money, that's the whole point there. But that means that they are incumbents, um, more in, in very often incumbents protecting their, all their existing markets and their existing way of doing things. So actually in, 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 in the worst case, a public-private partnership can work against the unnecessary in disruption or a, in the market that an entrepreneur, a startup could create because a startup is actually going out to upset things, to take part, to exchange the market so that, uh, so that they can take it. So how do we solve that? I think we have to do both. I think we both have to work with the large, big companies and we both have to, but we need to do it. We need to also do it so we can encourage and uh, bring forward and, and uh, let uh, the startups grow. Main problem in, in, in Europe when it comes to startups is, uh, is not the startups. We are getting more and more startups. It's the scale up we don't do as well. And in order to do scale up well, often we will need incumbents, often we will need the, the large uh, corporates that have the money. And if I may jump in here also because of time, it is the ecosystem again, it's the partnership, it's about sharing experience, sharing data, and make sure that we make this bigger. The cake is big enough, and as we always say, I'd rather have a little from a lot than a lot from nothing. This but panel it, it's is not zero, it's, sorry? It's not zero sum, it's the cake is growing. Sum, absolutely. Yes. The panel is really, really great. We are getting so many great insights also. I'm trying somehow to read what you guys are writing in the chat, listen to you, and moderate. I must say, I'm not a robo, and it's kind of difficult. Uh, we will try to catch up of some of your questions, not only questions, a lot of great insights, a lot of great thoughts that you guys out there are sharing. You all have a lot of experience. I think the panel, including the audience could last for 
a long time. Unfortunately, we have to finalize the panel now and to give the next speaker the virtual stage. So remain with us and we will make sure that we will go on with this discussion. Morten, Simon, Andy, it was my great pleasure to listen to you. It's really cool what's going on and what I would like to wish for all of you, for all of us, let's make it happen. Let's really turn Europe to a lighthouse for AI and especially give the new generation, the upcoming generation, a perspective, especially now with the crisis. So now it's my great, great pleasure to introduce you to the first representative for a use case from Norway. And this is Anita. She is the CEO and co-founder of Iris.ai, where they have built a world-leading AI engine for scientific text understanding serving academics and industry researchers. So Morten, thanks. This use case came from you. Iris.ai was one of the top 10 most innovative companies in AI in 2017, according to the Fast Company and a semi-finalist in the AI for Good X Prize 2020. Anita is also faculty in AI at the Singularity U Nordic. Forbes claims she was amongst the world's top 15 women in tech in 2019. Great work, Anita. The past decade, her career has spanned 10 industries, including developing an e-learning tool in Silicon Valley, reducing energy consumption in the process industry, facilitating solar light business in Kenya, and trying to disrupt the recruitment industry. She's also dropped by six universities on the way and built a race car. So now, the race is yours. Anita, welcome to our virtual stage and great to have you with us. Thank you. And let's see, I hope that both my screen and myself is visible. Um, if not, then please someone yell out. Um, it is lovely being here. And we're good. Um, all right. So um, my name is Anita Sharbreda. I am the CEO and co-founder of, of Iris. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. And I caught, you know, towards the end of the discussion um, uh, from the previous speakers, um, you know, I, I love the discussion of, of academia meets industry meets, meets startup. And that is really kind of worse up in many ways and, and right smack in the center of that. Um, and and I will say that we we are a Norwegian company, and we've asked by been asked by by Morten to to come here and represent Norway. Uh, but we're a very cross European team, and I think we count fourteen different different nationalities in a in a team of uh, of about twenty. So so that's us. Um, in short, the problem that we are aiming to solve is that we have an abundance of scientific knowledge. Right, we know more about the world than we have ever done before. Um, if you know, we are of the belief that if one person could sit down and read every single piece of scientific literature that has been published, we would solve a lot of problems on the spot. But obviously this overwhelming body of knowledge, it's too much for the human brain that hasn't gotten an upgrade in a, you know, in a few tens of thousand years. So we can't do that. So we set out five years ago, decided that we want to build an AI to do this for us, with us, make sense of all the knowledge, the scientific knowledge we have in the world. And we've actually spent the last almost five years building uh, an actually award-winning, uh, I will brag a little bit, AI engine for scientific text understanding. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, and actually right now, we're also specializing this engine into one domain, uh, chemistry specifically. But I also wanna talk about how we can take this engine and apply it um, to different fields. And again, this is all about scientific text, research type language. Um, as I mentioned, Iris was born back in 2015. Uh, and in 2017, we launched the first, kind of the first little iteration of our long-term vision, which is an AI researcher. We started small and we built what we call the literature review assistant or tool suite, if you like. 
And this tool suite um, already uh, is live in the marketplace. Uh, we are selling to university libraries and research uh, institutions. Um, and we have a great number of clients, especially in the Nordics, especially Finland. We also have the University of Oslo. So we're kind of properly establishing ourselves in the Nordic region. And, and in short, what these academic tools do, they are um, generalized on, so they're trained on a set of you know, uh, 18 plus million research papers. And then of course they're connected to, uh, to millions and millions of documents. Uh, and what these general tools do is that they help you first explore. So you start with a self-written problem statement, you branch out to find um, tens of thousands of documents, and then you take them over to the focus tool and you iterate down to a precise reading list. And these tools are, are tested and tried with academics, both on the you know, student early PhD side, but also um, well-versed researchers. Um, in general, what I'll say about this is that um, you know, building a machine that can understand scientific text, um, it is easier to deal with kind of harder sciences, so chemistry, um, physics, etc. And the moment you get over to philosophy papers, it is um, slightly harder with a nuanced language. Um, but these tools are general, i.e. They, um, they work for any piece of uh, published research paper or, or patents as well are, are incorporated into the platform. Um, so this is kind of what we have been doing for the last year. But what I really want to talk about today is uh, where we are going right now and what we're doing, because the next step on this journey is for Iris AI, the, the researcher, to become a specialist. Um, and we've picked one specific domain and we ended up picking the chemical industry. Um, and, and I won't go into too much detail beyond saying that the chemical industry is very, very ripe for disruption, speaking of the, the previous um, the previous discussion, uh, and there is a need for digitalization. And so we saw an opportunity where there weren't a lot of players, um, but it's a really interesting field also scientifically. Of course, we also need to connect it into the sustainability um, work that needs to be done where the chemical industry simply has to play a major role. Um, and so that's one of the, some of the reasons why we, why we chose to go into chemicals um, and the chemical industry. But, the point is that Iris AI needs to specialize into something. Chemistry is the first one, and I'll talk about how we do that. Um, but first, and, and I won't bore you with too many technical details for those of you who are on, uh, on and watching that aren't uh, deeply technical, but it is, you know, it's a, it's a set of core algorithms based on the recent years breakthrough um, in AI, natural language understanding and processing, et cetera. Um, it's a combination of, of uh, open access, uh, open source, and, and our own proprietary algorithms. And in short, what we deal with is similarity between two different pieces of text. How similar is this text and this text to each other? We use a proprietary metric that we call the wisdom metric um, for that. Um, we are also dealing with compositionality. Um, we are dealing with causality uh, and we're dealing with ranking metrics. So um, how are these, all of these topics and concepts and words and sentences related to each other? Are there causal relationships? Are there parent child categories, et cetera? And of all of this, for your specific need, what is most important? That was a very uh, high level uh, description. But what is interesting is that our core engine is trained, as I said, on scientific research in general, right? So we picked a data set of 18 million articles for parts of the algorithms, for, for other parts, we have a smaller data set of about 5 million, but we have this kind of massive and general data set that the core uh, engine is already trained on. So what we need to do when we go into a new field and deploy the same engine is that we need um, to specialize that engine. And the way we've built the technology means that it, it can be quite easily, and I say quite because there's always some, some labor in it, of course, but it can be quite easily um, specialized on a new domain. So what we do with this core engine when, when diving into, for example, chemistry, is that we can reinforce it towards a specific domain. 
So one of the ways, uh, one of the ways we can do that, you know, when we work with with clients and building out these specific tools, is that we can take a data set of more specialized research papers. So we take, you know, a few thousand papers within that specific, you know, users or clients domain, and we run it through the engine again to to force the engine to understand more of that specific research field. We can also sometimes go even more in depth and look at pre-existing human-made ontologies, so overviews created by a domain expert. And feeding that to the engine makes it even more um, specific. And again, what you need here depends on um, on the use case that you are solving. And then of course, we also get to the fun part, especially when working with big corporates about the integrations, integration into business processes, different problems. And you know, the, you know, an, a researcher in the chemical space will have one type of problems. And then you move over to pharma and it's a separate type of problem. You move over to physics and, and again, so it's really about taking, you know, taking the core engine and retraining it or, or reinforcing it but also understanding the specific needs of the specific industry. Um, and that is really kind of what I want to talk about uh, specifically as, a, um, as we are developing this tool. And one thing is taking the core entering engine and reinforcing it, uh, but we also have to turn that into tools, right? Specific tools for specific use cases. Um, and what uh, we are building right now, some of these are, they're in different stages of development. None of them are fully commercially available. Uh, some of this is, is among the first time we talk about at a conference. Um, but basically there is a tool that we call Discover, which is about mapping out relevant researchers, research sources. And you'll see some similarities with the academic tool, right? You're dealing with unknown unknowns. What else do I need to learn before diving into this project? Then um, there is the identify tool where it's a lot more about, well, I know that I don't know this. I know the information is out there and I need to pinpoint that specific information. And a use case here, it goes beyond a literature review, a use case here is I have a, a compound or a chemical, um, it is, it is you know, non-toxic, it's biodegradable, I know it can replace you know, uh, existing materials, but I don't know where I should be applying it. I don't know what the, what the application areas are. And here, the identify tool, which is a, a type of conversational um, engine, will help you pinpoint exactly why it is your material is so special and find out exactly you know, if there are other people that have described that specific need or those specific properties. Um, and then um, the third kind of more granular um, level is uh, what we call uh, the extract tool or extracting all key data points from, um, from a document. And here we're dealing with known knowns, as in the information is right here, but I need this information in an actionable format. Um, and so that's the one I want to just give you a quick uh, insight into. Um, the extract tool, um, it is about, for example, one of the use cases we are um, running right now is extracting data from patents in order to prepare for lab work, right? So it's a very concrete task. The experiment data includes, you know, what products, what processes, what units, what values, how have we been running these experiments? Now, you can totally do this as a human being. You sit down with 60 patents and you extract all that data and it will take you a full month of your time it's also a really error prone process because especially when dealing with numbers, the human brain isn't, isn't all that good to extract all this, those bits and pieces. And it is incredibly boring. So what we uh, have built is this extract tool where we take the text from the patent, we take um, the tables from the patent, we turn that into uh, an ontology using a pre-existing ontology, as I mentioned. Um, and then we fill and populate a spreadsheet with all of the data we have extracted. And, and on the surface, this seems fairly simple. Um, but however, keep in mind that a researcher will never use the, the same language as their, as their colleague, right? They might ex describe something as just, um, you know, and then we rolled it, not hot rolled it and cold rolled it. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of implicit knowledge built into the language that the machine has to understand. 
Uh, and so this is why this is incredibly complicated um, to do, um, not to mention that you have to deal with different formats, different tables. We have to you know, build a table extractor, et cetera, et cetera. And I won't bore you with all the technical details, but it's, um, it's been a fun ride. And so what we're seeing in terms of results here is that, as I said, there are 60 patents, uh, for example, as, a, as an example, equals one person month of a researcher's time and as I said, it's an error prone process. The results that we're seeing right now is that we can process automatically 60 patents in less than four minutes. And we are looking at a 90% accuracy, precision and recall. And again, this is for the extract tool specifically and the core engine can be used in many other circumstances as well. So it is super exciting to see that we have something that can really change the way researchers do their work and it'll open up so much time to actually go into the lab. Um, and test this. Um, and so finally, to wrap this up, our long-term vision, you know, I mentioned we did the literature review assistant, becoming a specialist in chemistry, and then a few other fields, uh, before we build what we call an, an AI researcher that will be an essential and, and interdisciplinary team member um, that will be essential to any research team in the world. And that is what we are working towards. So with that, uh, thank you very much for listening. And I believe there might be time for uh, a question or two. Thanks a lot, Anita, for these insights. I tried to read through some of the comments and the questions, and I'm very happy that a lot of you guys out there enjoyed also the tech stuff that we just got now. It was really interesting. What I just realized, and you mentioned the language by yourself, it is also to build the bridge between the diverse audience that we have. And um, from that perspective, I would like to ask you, how would you try to summarize the main goal of your development, of your idea for a business person in business language? <laughs> well, so there's, there's two parts to the answer. The first one is our impact side, which not all business people will necessarily understand because talking about impact in a business context is not always um, the key point, but we are a for, for profit, but for impact business. That means our ultimate goal is to leverage all of the research in the world to make the world a better place. That is on the impact side. And then on the business side is about building really smart tools that go straight into the core um, of, of the, you know, of, of industry uh, enterprises where R&D is a central part. We go straight into the core and we make sure that the R&D personnel is way more efficient in their work and we can both save them months of, of manual labor. And these are, you know, high cost individuals. And of course, find those nuggets of insights that that you cannot find as a human being. There's too much information, you cannot find it, and our machine can find it for you. Thanks a lot for this answer. Uh, we have another two questions. So one is, can one use the extract tool to data simultaneous, sorry, si simulation? In terms of data simulation, well, it's a little generic uh, question if I understand it right. Um, so, so the extraction really takes text and tables and we take that extract it into a tabular format. So if you want to do a data, if you want to do a simulation that is based on data that is in a format where you can't automatically get it into a table into the numbers and rows and columns you want, that is, that is what the extract tool does. It's the link between here's all this text, all these tables, but they're not, it's not necessarily in a coherent format. Take that and place it into a tabular format that you can then keep doing. I hope that answered, uh, that answered that question. I hope so too. What are your main challenges? Uh, too. Uh, I mean, besides from the obvious technology development, uh, you know, AI is a, a field that requires both time and research effort. Uh, we do have in-house researchers, so we're not just applied. We're we're developing some some approaches and algorithms and models that that hasn't been done yet. So we're tackling things that haven't been done. That's on the one side. 
obviously there's fundraising. Um, I didn't catch all of the previous discussion, but like the US versus Europe perspective, unfortunately, the, the European venture capital landscape isn't, uh, isn't anywhere near what we're seeing in the US. So we said we would be a European uh, company and we kind of put our foot down and said, we're gonna prove that it's possible. And, and yes, it is, but it's been a hard journey in, in raising uh, substantial capital for the company. So um, that's a couple of the couple of things. Thanks. So let's benefit now, at least from our audience. Let's I'm support. now not hearing Make you, unfortunately. Sure. Can you hear me, Anita? Can you hear there me? There we go. Yes. So let's make sure we're supporting our European startups and make sure that we're doing the right stuff together and that they don't need to go elsewhere. Thanks a lot for being with us, Anita, especially on this short notice. It was great, great talking to you and we'll keep in touch. Thank you, you so too. much. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the next speaker, Harry Davis. He is AI lead at Tech Nation from UK and will represent with his colleague, Amy King from People Matter, the next use case. David, uh, sorry, Harry, the stage is yours. I was told that you're going to introduce you guys by yourself. Thanks a lot for being with us. Great. Thank you so much. Um, a very good afternoon, everybody, from a, a rather cloudy uh, London. Um, my name, as, um, as was mentioned, is Harry Davis, and I work at Tech Nation, which is a, a UK government backed body that champions the technology sector here in the UK. Uh, and really puts uh, technology at the forefront of jobs and the UK economy. In terms of what that means day to day, it means that we run the Global Talent Visa Scheme uh, for international talent uh, that can endorse really anybody looking to come into the UK to work in technology from VCs to startup founders to engineers. Um, last year, we processed about a thousand UK visas and uh, the next year it will be uncapped. So a good source of um, a good mechanism for anybody looking to move into the UK for technology. We monitor the, the strength of the UK tech through data-driven insights, and we have champions uh, to really look at evangelizing technology from across the UK, so in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and throughout England too. But core to what we do is run free growth programs for the UK's most exciting scale-up companies, where really we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and knowledge share across founders and their leadership teams. And you know, alumni of these programs include Skyscanner, Zoopla, Revolut, Monzo, Starling, Dark Trace, and many others. And so far, they've gone on to raise over $10 billion. Um, so it's so really trying to put uh, technology really at the heart of, of UK growth. I specifically focus on supporting scale ups that have AI at the heart of their proposition uh, from C to Series A. And we're also looking for our next cohort of founders, too. So if you do know anybody uh, in the UK that has a, an AI company that you think might fit, please do reach out to me afterwards. And equally, if you think there's anything that you wish to ask about the UK AI startup scene or about the UK startup scene more generally, please do find me in the backstage afterwards. Um, in the meantime, I'd be delighted to introduce you to Amy King, who's the founder and CEO of People Matter Tech. And um, this went through our last AI cohort. Um, so it's brilliant to see founders tackling meaningful problems like mental health using AI. And you know, should you see ways in which you think you might be able to help them, uh, please do reach out either directly or through the backstage. So without further ado, if, if she's here, I will introduce you to Amy King. See, so we have her online there. Harry, can you hear me? I can hear you. I think we're just missing hey. Amy, I believe. Yes, somehow tech is really letting us down. <laughs> and I hope it's not something against women because it's the second woman who can't come, come can get in. Uh, uh, Apparently she's waiting to be, uh, waiting to be let in as um, ever yeah, with Zoom. So she's uh, check she's that Perfect. you can imagine. We're doing our best. Uh, so in the meantime, it would be great if you can go on introducing what you're doing, uh, is she coming? I can see some eyebrows. She's not in. 
sure i mean what's great for be happy to elaborate on on what we do i mean yeah, very okay. much very much for for us i suppose it's um we, we were set up by uh david cameron's government back in 2011 um and really i suppose it was all about evangelizing london focused tech and london-based tech and uh, for about two years we've become tech nation so it's very much about supporting scale up founders across the UK and very much at the heart of the UK government's agenda over the next few years it is not just putting technologies like AI, um, Internet of Things, um, net zero technology, carbon technology and what have you, all important technologies uh, on the agenda but, but also to make sure that the whole UK benefits. So a large part of our mission is making sure that we're supporting founders in, in Wales and in Scotland in Northern Ireland and elsewhere through England. And I, I think when people look at UK tech, I think often um, they tend to look at London. And to be fair, I think in AI, uh, as you may have heard today, I think there's certainly great cause for that. I think in London, we have uh, companies like uh, DeepMind, which is acquired by Google, that very much, as you'll know, is at the forefront of, of AI research. Um, we've got organizations like the Turing Fest, looking at how we accelerate um, AI um, in, uh, in research. We also then have um, a really thriving VC scene around artificial intelligence and other technologies in, in London. Um, but, but I think we also have clusters now that are starting to develop across the UK. So if you look at uh, Bristol, for example, in the Southwest, uh, a, a very much a, a core uh, piece of, of their growth has been around robotics and artificial intelligence. And you know, there's a company there called Graphcore, which is now, which many of you will know, is doing very well. It's backed by Sequoia in the United States uh, and is thriving. Um, and e equally, a, another company there called Five AI, looking at really at the forefront of technology for autonomous vehicles. So Bristol is, is increasingly thriving, um, as are other parts of the UK, like Edinburgh, with, with a twenty million pound uh, base centre and data centre, oh, yeah, and other uh, other parts of the UK too. So that's what we're here to do. And if you, if you want to learn anything more about that, or want to learn a bit more about technology across the UK more generally feel free to grab me in the backstage and in the meantime i think we have amy hi thank you harry and sorry guys i had some technical difficulties getting in there um thank you for joining me my name is amy king and as harry very kindly introduced i am the ceo and co-founder of a tech startup called people matter um so i'm going to give you a whistle top stop tour of what we do um, and uh, bring to life really how we start to think about um, ethical AI in the space of well-being. Now, our whole purpose as a business is to help everyone to be their best self and to create a more caring world. Um, I'm personally really passionate about how we do that through bringing together the latest psychology with data and te technological innovation. So I'm just gonna share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to very shortly um, see my presentation. Okay, um, so um, in terms of what we do, so um, we were founded in 2018 and we specialize in building intelligent mental wellness tools. And um, what we mean by that is our day-to-day -day world is highly chaotic, highly complex, and through the use of intelligent technology, um, we aim to help people to make sense of what's happening around them as well as how they're responding to that in a way that can make sense. And this is really in recognition of today's world and today's problem, which is um, by design and almost by accident, we, we've ended up in a very complex world. Um, obviously with COVID-19, that brings an added dynamic. Um, but if you think about the rate of change, disruption, technology, we're always on. And what used to feel quite simple in, in our time to adjust to change and quite predictable, we're now thrown into the realm of many unknowns um, and trying to keep up with that is really difficult. And when we look at the world of work, the other acknowledgement that we start with uh, when we think about this space is reinvention is really the new norm. So our organisations were really built uh, for a very different scenario where we had time to plan, uh, form teams and execute on that and, and review that in a very um, controlled way. Organisations today are having to be much quicker to assemble teams and perform at speed in a fluid way. Uh, so the traditional structures aren't really built to last. And 
And what this means is there's more emphasis now in our organisations and, and within our working lives on culture, how we connect, how we keep ourselves in check so that we can be on point and ultimately be our best. Um, and unless we start to shift ourselves towards how we build that capability and how um, we get a better read on this stuff, it's going to feel hard and we're going to suffer. And that really leads to me to my next point, which is the world we live in. Uh, technology is having a really profound impact. Um, as, as we've heard, there's so many exciting things that it can help us do. But it also begs a question to us as to, from a human perspective, is it really serving us? Does it help our mental well-being, or is it actually undermining it? Um, and it's leading to more and more questions, actually, in terms of um, the democracy of data and um, how, how that can also be manipulated in a way that can feel quite negative. So it's a real mishmash at the moment and forces us to ask the question, have we lost sight of the human? We've got all this great tech, but what does it really mean from a mental well-being perspective? Um, these are just a few statistics uh, just to bring to life um, really the um, to, to the extent to which mental health is impacting us um, in, within our societies. So there has been an increase of um, some of the dark sides of poor mental health, whether you look at suicide or rates of burnout and depression, um, but it also has a huge economic impact to our businesses and, and also in terms of our economy at a, at a larger scale. It's estimated to cost $1 trillion um, due to poor mental health uh, a year. And, and as I said, that seems to be increasing. Um, final point on this is uh, it does also ask us, it begs the question for us around trust. Um, and no doubt it's front and centre when you start thinking about the application of AI as to what is trustworthy and uh, how you start to judge ethics of AI, because it can also be used for harm rather than good. But uh, within societies, uh, this is a yearly uh, survey done by Ed the Edelman Trust, it's Barometer of Trust. And they analyze people across the world to say how, what are the levels of trust today in society and within organizations? Um, and within 2020, in general, it's seen as pretty low in terms of competency and, and the ethics around uh, how institutions, organizations, technology companies are running. So uh, some, some big questions there and uh, a lot more awareness being raised around this. So when we look at AI um, and uh, just to be clear, I'm, I'm a psychologist by trade and um, I'm fascinated by human behaviour, human psychology and how we uh, reach, reach our sense of fulfilment um, and potential. And what AI does is it gives us a new capability set, a new uh, set of resources to be able to prob so problem solve in new ways, in much more powerful ways and in faster ways. So the question for us here is, and that we've been asking ourselves at People Matter is, can AI actually be applied in a way that it can do good from a mental wellness perspective? So the first challenge is well-being solutions often get really oversimplified. Um, so any technology or any approach that we take um, can fall trap to three problems. Uh, one is we oversimplify it in the sense that we label and put people in boxes um, and we overgeneralize. The second is it can become too clinical, which becomes too much about diagnosis. And the third is that we just miss the true need. Um, so if we're going to apply AI and technology in a way that's going to be meaningful, we need to overcome these three common pitfalls. So the starting point for us is if, if we're going to make better sense of ourselves and therefore be at our best to thrive, um, how do we do that? And what is the role of data to help us um, ultimately work our way through what can feel quite intangible. Um, and the question that then arises with any data that we use is how accurate can we really be? Um, and almost what is accurate? Um, so question number one for uh, the wellbeing space is subjective wellbeing. So this is really our perception of how we're thinking, feeling and responding to stresses around us. And we're all different. So what stresses me will be completely different to, to, to how things will stress you. And we'll have different tolerance levels in terms of where we tip over and say this is too much versus this is challenging and fun and engaging. So it's, it's very subjective. Um, the challenge of only relying on subjective well-being as a data point, whilst it is useful, 
is we are all uh, very subject to attentional biases, um, whether that's positive or negative. And the second is um, to fuel technology with subjective wellbeing data, it requires human input. It means you have to sit and fill in a survey um, in some shape or form quite often. So we started to explore what other clues exist around uh, our environment, our lifestyles, um, and ultimately our well-being that could start to give a more tangible and more seamless way to help us make sense of our mental well-being. So there's two lenses to the world of what we do at People Matter. One is subjective well-being, and that is how you're really truly feeling and experiencing something. And the other is what is happening in your digital world, data that already exists around you that actually tells a story around your lifestyle, your working patterns, who you're working with and why. And um, all of that starts to paint the picture as to what that balance might look like for you. So we've been working on um, a hugely exciting um, uh, piece of research and development, which has subsequently underpinned our product and proposition, which is uh, to test the hypothesis that your digital self, which is data that already exists about you, um, can be meaningful and give you insight to what that could mean from your well-being. So we've been working with a large corporation to partner with, can we look at digital metadata? So this is data about data, looking at uh, email and calendar data and looking at trends over time, combined with data about you as an employee, so where you work, um, for how long, who your manager is, along with your sentiment, which is um, really starting to drill into things such as language and what that might mean with what's happening around you. So, so what we've been ultimately doing is um, processing masses of data uh, with consent um, from employees within our research and development partners to build models to say, can we start to predict uh, things such as stress, absence, uh, burnout risk, um, and other outcomes such as performance um, and well-being on, on a broader scale? And sat behind this, just to be really clear, as with any data, is we've centered everything that we do on a principle of deep trust. So at, with, any, with any solution, we have to center our data methodologies on ethical AI in the sense that individuals who are working with us and ultimately use our products um, have complete transparency, complete control, and full consent um, uh, responsibilities of their data. So at no point is data misused um, or even uh, kind of driven in a way that you can be individually identified. So that's been the first part of our work. Um, and underpin within this is with any AI that you start to apply to the realm of human beings, you have to underpin it with um, a, a, a science that sits behind it. So um, underpinned within our work is what we call a psychosocial model. Um, and this is where we start to look at not just how you're feeling uh, from an emotional perspective, but we're looking at how these digital cues and your subjective well-being um, is, is being shaped by your environmental pressures, um, your environmental boosts, so how these two things interplay. Are you in a sustainable space or are you in a risky, unhealthy environment that's draining your resources and putting you at risk? And then, and then lastly, your behaviour which is how you respond and how you react to what's happening around you. Um, so through this modeling, which is, if you imagine uh, you know, a funnel of data being passed through, which is messy, chaotic, raw data, to then processing that into variables that are meaningful, and then into the models, which um, actually start to give you insight on, so what does that data mean? we're able to articulate that down to a wellness index out of 100, 100 being great uh, and zero suggesting you're at risk, and then drill down across the model around what that might mean um, for each area. And what we found is through this modelling, um, we can start to see insights and relationships between um, if you have a healthy wellness index, um, you're much less likely to be at risk of taking time off due to stress. So these are based on real data points we've um, been gathering and developing over time. It also links to flight risk. Ultimately, if you start to suffer, um, uh, disengage with your workplace and 
um, ultimately not be at your best, you're more likely to want to leave. So we can see a direct link from aspects such as your di digital working patterns and your well-being profile to what that might mean to how you're relating to your work. Um, so that's been really exciting with how we've started to apply data and machine learning to build models. Now, bringing all of this together then and how we uh, really start to surface and benefit the end user, we've built an app called Akina. We call it your mental wellness companion. And this is where we're taking it to the next level from modeling through to uh, behavior change and insight to the end user. Um, now, as, as I've said, this is all centered on the the, the principle of deep trust. So users are completely private. It's up to you what data you share. You can be completely invisible should you wish to. And finally, we're really, really clear on, we, we don't have a black box principle here, but we, we're able to explain how our AI works in terms of the scientific approach and the models that underpins what we do. And um, Within the app, um, what the user is then able to do, and this is really how AI is starting to add value to, to individuals, is within a private space within the app, you can drill into your measures. So based on all the data around you, what does it mean and why might you feel that way? So you can start to drill into not just your overall scores, but um, how it starts to um, drill down and then starts to um, build into your reports. Uh, so you can see your um, your insights over time. Um, I'm just going to whiz through a few more slides um, and wrap up. Um, there's a few features within the app, um, but ultimately within the tech space, there's a huge amount that you can do with AI. Um, there's another example here where intelligent chatbots are starting to make sense of data. Um, and a huge amount of re research has now been done to say the way that language is processed and sentiment can actually start to highlight markers of uh, depression which is really exciting. Final few points here with the opportunities of AI and wellbeing, you can personalise the experience. Um, so we've been seeing this for years uh, with platforms such as Netflix to personalise um, your content. Uh, Spotify is very well known for this um, and it's starting to then share back insights about how you consume music to what that might mean for future playlists that you might like. So the question for us is, let's do that for well-being. If you combine this data together, you can start to feed right content, right time, which serves you much better than just generic well-being content, which is another application of AI. Um, so within this example, we've got a library and we've got tips that start to become personalized based on the scores that we've learned about you. Um, and finally, uh, the third part of this really sits around prediction, um, but, to, but actually moves on to prevention. With the right data and with the right insights, we can start to take action in a way that prevents um, negative well-being or poor mental well-being um, really developing. Um, so we work with organisations, we work with people to take meaningful action by making sense of data um, so that you can avoid problems before they happen. And this is really then started to bring to life through analytics um, and the platform overall. Um, so, so that's that's us. So that's what we do. We um, apply AI by taking uh, something that feels very tangible, intangible, and making it tangible, like you would with what's the score, what does it mean. Um, you can personalize data um, and content then based on what we learn, and then ultimately uh, create trust by ensuring that you're completely private. Um, so that's me. Um, I'm not sure um, how we're doing for time. Um, I, if there's any questions, uh, please do let me know. But uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. Thanks a lot, Amy. It was very, very interesting. Um, because we had some tech issues at the beginning, we're running out of time a little bit. So there are some questions out there. I would really like to ask these people to reach out directly to Amy, either go to the backstage, virtual backstage room, or check it in a one-to-one, -one because we have our friends from France waiting for the virtual stage. So Amy, thanks a lot to be with Thank us you. and sharing this great insights with us. No now worries. it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Nicolas Merit. He is the CEO and founder of DreamQuark. Nicolas launched DreamQuark after his PhD in practical physics in 2014. 
passionate about AI and finance, that he also dedicated his career to focusing on responsibility and sustainability worldwide. Nicola is involved and has launched initiatives to ensure the leadership of France in AI and to use the emergences of new global leaders in AI. He is also involved in his initiatives around AI that could benefit the entire economy as well as the most fragile populations. He has been named a 40 under 40 by the F2 initiative launched by the French China Committee. With him together on stage, we have Iman Said from Actuary. He had a trip, sorry, <coughs> my, my voice. He had a transverse hearing and data scientist of directors at Direction de l'Actuarien AG2R La Mondiale. This is all about my French. After some years of experience in a consultancy group where she worked on multiple subjects linked to insurance and banking, Imen had joined AG2R La Mondiale to help develop AI solutions for actual issues. The stage is all yours. Thanks for being with us. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dalis, uh, for that introduction. Uh, to uh, briefly present uh, us, uh, so you already made the presentation. So thank you. I'm really pleased to be on stage with uh, Imen. Uh, we've been working with uh, ag 2 la Mondiale since uh, now almost three years uh, in, uh, in France. Uh, we have built a really strong uh, trust relationship and uh, Imen uh, has been really instrumental in uh, the results that we achieve uh, today with uh, ag 2 la Mondiale uh, around uh, churn. So I want to uh, present different uh, topics. Uh, first, uh, highlight a couple of challenges that the financial services uh, industry is facing, and um, then uh, highlight whether or not uh, responsible AI, which is a, a really significant trend right now, can help them uh, in overcoming this uh, challenge. So, so financial services are right now facing um, the, uh, a couple of uh, challenges uh, since uh, a while. I think COVID-19 is uh, on top of the priority right now, and uh, this is uh, increasing the, the pressure on them after uh, having been uh, pressurized quite a lot. Uh, what we see is that, um, in particular in Europe, uh, because of the BC um, European uh, Central Bank um, like, uh, politics, uh, they have been uh, under margin pressure because uh, interest rates have been uh, significantly low for, for a couple of time. Uh, on top of that, they have uh, an increasing uh, regulatory pressure uh, that uh, is pushing uh, the margin further and they need to uh, develop uh, different tools in order to overcome uh, that uh, regulatory challenges. Uh, they are all uh, under um, digitization uh, and that uh, a really high challenge to move all the different softwares uh, in the cloud to provide new customer experience. And on top of that, after uh, COVID and uh, digitization, uh, after uh, regulation, after uh, low margin, they have now also to uh, focus their effort on improving the sustainability uh, of their business model. So we, um, they have uh, understood that um, they have data and uh, they started for, since a couple of time uh, to um, uh, investigate how artificial intelligence could actually help them overcome a couple of these challenges by being uh, able to create uh, more, competing, uh, more competitive business models. And what we've seen uh, uh, on top of that over the, the past uh, two years is that uh, there is a new world that has emerged, which is uh, responsible AI. So they need to um, now uh, face a couple of uh, different questions, uh, tough questions uh, that uh, they need to uh, find answer. Um, so I highlighted a couple of these um, questions uh, that they are asking themselves. There are uh, different topics, but uh, overall there are six, category, six categories of uh, questions uh, that uh, they are asking. Question about uh, infrastructure, question about data, question about algorithm, uh, question about people, processes, or use case. And um, out of all these um, questions that uh, I summarized there, uh, there are some that have become extremely important. Uh, one of the most important right now in terms of uh, 
AI is uh, how, so I've developed uh, algorithm, I've been deploying algorithm. And uh, the main question now is, uh, can I really trust uh, this algorithm? This is uh, the purpose of responsible AI to be able to help uh, companies to uh, answer that question. But there are uh, other questions. Trust is not uh, the, the single issue there. Uh, they have a um, question about uh, what use case to prioritize, uh, how to generate a significant return investment to show that actually artificial intelligence is really uh, a weapon of choice uh, to address these challenges. Uh, they ask themselves, okay, I've developed um, a new algorithm, but there is a, a new uh, paradigm that uh, has been emerging with uh, AI and machine learning is that uh, in the past they had rules, rule system, so it was really easy to follow the rules. Now they are moving to self-learning algorithm and the question uh, that they face right now is these systems that are continuously learning, how can I be able to maintain them? How can I be sure that uh, over time I still trust uh, the result of these algorithms that have been deployed uh, when they were validated? Many different challenges, uh, many different questions. And uh, we see that uh, the ones that actually answer the best uh, to this question have uh, had a competitive edge. So this is a, an analysis from uh, McKinsey that shows that uh, there, there is a, a significant um, like, uh, spread between the different companies and the companies that actually have been able to integrate responsible AI in their uh, models uh, are actually able to be more competitive and get better results at the end. So there are a question in particular on trust. Uh, explainability has been uh, instrumental into the success of uh, AI initiatives uh, in, uh, in the most performing companies, but also being able to demonstrate a, a significant return investment uh, is important uh, on the first use case you developed because uh, that uh, brings all the company to, to trust uh, that results. So at DreamQuark, uh, to uh, show a bit what we have been doing over the six years, is that we've, we've been working in order to help financial services to answer this tough question. Uh, at DreamQuark, we are uh, really a software company, a, a tech company, and uh, we spend our day to uh, develop software to accelerate uh, this uh, transition to a really uh, intelligent organization. And we have put the emphasis on responsible AI since uh, almost the beginning of the company. Uh, we have had uh, a couple of areas of focus, but the main focus of our company has been on explainability, being able to uh, show that um, for each decision uh, that uh, is being taken uh, in the organization with AI, uh, we are able to explain how they are being taken. And that's really important uh, to uh, then uh, provide uh, really compelling uh, results with AI. We also have uh, decided to uh, focus on a couple of use cases. Uh, a couple of use cases that demonstrate a really significant value for our customers. Uh, in, yes, uh, in order to show them uh, return investment. Uh, so we have prioritized uh, customer segmentation, uh, personalization of uh, financial services proposition, uh, churn also, uh, being able to retain customer is really important. And then we have also uh, focused on our effort on helping uh, financial services to be uh, more efficient in terms of compliance or uh, creating better risk models. So we have this solution, uh, Brain. Uh, that solution is a, a software in three parts. One part where uh, we made really easy uh, the conception of artificial intelligence models uh, by people with low, uh, with low uh, technical skills. Second, a part where it's really easy to integrate that models with existing application. And the third part where it is really easy to monitor and to maintain uh, the algorithm over time. And over these three parts, explainability is at the, at the core of our value proposition. So one example there is a digital advisory um, solution uh, that uh, is being used and uh, so that continue to develop that being used to uh, accelerate the low carbon transition. So one way to accelerate the low carbon transition into, is to invest into companies that are low carbon uh, driven. And uh, we uh, use AI to pro propose a sustainable investment recommendation uh, to different type of investors. Uh, so the, the low carbon transition can be accelerated with AI. Another case uh, is around um, upsell and cross-sell where we are able to uh, make CRM more intelligent by, by providing um, recommendations that are powered by AI. And for each of the recommendations uh, that the sales are seeing in their system, uh, they know why they should uh, trust that uh, recommendation. We provide them 
tools to investigate in details uh, the, the why of that proposition has been rec recommended. So well, I, I will uh, then uh, finalize with, uh, with a case that we did with uh, at ag 2 la Mondiale, uh, summarize quickly uh, that use case and uh, leave the, the final minutes to, uh, to women. So the use case that we had with uh, ag 2 was a, a churn uh, detection problem. We wanted to identify customers uh, that were uh, leaving the insurance company at the end of the year. Uh, so we have a, a time to, uh, to market, I would say, uh, because uh, it's really important that we reach out to the customer because they, before they leave. So how we proceed, uh, so we had different data. So this is what I summarized there, uh, different tables. Uh, one table with information, with the story of people that left and people that uh, remain the uh, insurance companies, different data about contracts, about uh, uh, who the customer is, uh, how often they interact with, uh, with the banks and by using brain, uh, Agile model has been able to create a churn model, first churn model, and that churn model is then applied on new data. So you have contract data, customer data, relationship data, and based on that data, the model is able to say uh, two things, uh, whether the customer is uh, likely to, to churn, and uh, second, uh, why uh, is that customer uh, churning? So this is uh, the case we did. So we leave uh, the, the final minutes to, to Iman to show how we work all together and, and what are the results. Yes, uh, thank you, Nicholas, for uh, the introduction of the use case. So um, uh, what I wanted to emphasize on from a business point of view is that uh, this use case was, was, a, success, was a success because um, there, there was a need that was identified by us. We are an insurance company, a customer-oriented uh, service, and we identified this problem to know better our customers and more particularly know where, why they may or may not leave our, our company. So um, we had uh, two types of profiles, insurance experts on one hand and then data scientists on the other hand with dream quirk. And we both communicated using this interface that was very helpful for um, uh, a business for business experts who didn't have the uh, uh, AI tools or the uh, machine learning, who didn't really know algorithms of machine learning. So it was uh, throughout the use case, there was a complementarity between two uh, comp competences, two expertises to, uh, to create a new solution um, that uh, will be, uh, that wouldn't uh, be there if there wasn't uh, uh, the communication between those two skills. Um, so what I really want to emphasize on is that um, uh, AI solution is very important uh, for business problems uh, when uh, there is a need that is uh, established and the solution should be innovative and should um, show its value. And that was the case uh, uh, in this uh, experience. And um, uh, what we really need to, to, to show to, uh, to uh, investors and to uh, countries, to people, so they can put more time and money on AI development is that um, um, these solutions, uh, the development of AI is not a luxury. It's, we, we are not doing this only for fun, though it is really a fun science, but uh, also because it brings value. We didn't have, we knew that we have a priori business a priori. We knew that we have enough data to uh, enlighten some uh, and highlight some patterns we didn't know. And um, the, the tools brought by uh, uh, dream quirk in this collaboration uh, made us know better our portfolio and uh, pro predict uh, this uh, this um, behavior the churn behavior and uh, go further in the analysis uh, and um, that's why uh, it's a solution that we couldn't reach without AI without this interface that were really helpful very user friendly for uh, business experts. So may, maybe to, to conclude, so thank you very much, uh, Imen. What I want to say is that uh, I uh, was highlighting a, a question, uh, is responsible, the way, uh, responsible AI the way to go for financial services? So I think it's much broader than that. Uh, what we uh, demonstrate is that it actually brings value, economic value, but uh, by uh, reconciliating this economic value with uh, sustainable goals, AI can actually also help us uh, achieve these sustainable goals. 
So this is a moment uh, of uh, choice after that uh, crisis to invest more into AI, in particular into uh, the, the French or European uh, startups. Uh, we need this startup for our sovereignty. And I uh, want at Drunkwark uh, that we create a leader because European, uh, Euro is the European Union, uh, Europe as well, uh, need leaders in order to drive uh, the, the change after that COVID-19 uh, period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Imen. Thank you, you Dalis. Uh, for that invitation and uh, let's go. Thank you very much to both of you. Please remain, don't go. We do have some questions for you. Okay. So one question is about what are the cultural prerequisites for such projects? Do you want to start or? I, I didn't hear the what, question. Sorry. What are the prerequisites from a culture perspective for such projects? Um, from a business point of view, um, I think we, we, uh, we, we had to, um, to establish, to identify the need and uh, to be uh, able to assess the value of the project and to be to understand that these are tools that will complement that are essential to complement our classic models of churn. So, uh, as uh, Nicolas mentioned, the insurance market is a, a market in evolution, and uh, there are new players at the market. So, it is really important to uh, to understand that. Um, AI tools are uh, no more luxury, but a must to uh, better do our business, to better do our uh, jobs. Uh, I think that's something we need to establish and to understand before we go uh, to this type of experience. And then we should uh, make sure to have the tools to assess the value. And that's how we, we can show people that it's important to invest and to develop these tools. Something I want to, to add is uh, from all the prospect or customer I've been discussing with, um, one element of culture is uh, openness. Uh, so willing to share the data with an external provider uh, where we know that uh, in particular in Europe, privacy is really uh, key and uh, really uh, uh, important. The second element is uh, playing to win, not uh, playing to not lose. Uh, and this is uh, extremely important that uh, uh, the company is willing to take risks to. Uh, uh, work with the startups, startups that is really uh, bold uh, and to say, okay, I have this uh, new idea, I, I need to, to try it. So being able to, to take risks, but uh, being really aud aud more audacity than uh, uh, risk taking. And uh, the, third, uh, the third aspect is uh, being able to create the trust. So it has been a, a, a trust that, uh, that we, have, we have taken, that has been in instrumental for, for the success of that project. And finally, maybe uh, because it's innovation, uh, the result doesn't don't, don't come uh, straight on. So it took a, a couple of time to, to get that result. Now Quark is more ready. So we accelerate the time to market, but initially uh, it has been uh, trial and errors. And uh, we have decided to uh, jump back on the horse uh, a couple of times. And all that all together uh, helped uh, AG2 Mondial to get that result. And uh, it has naturally helped also Quark a lot. Right, thanks a lot. I think this is something that we've heard already last time also, and this is also something that I really love to repeat. We need to take risk. We need to have partnerships. We need to be iterative in our development, in looking for results. This is how we can learn. It doesn't matter how often we do it. It's the goal that we need to achieve and this is something we can do all together where as a last question where do you see additionally industries or um, businesses where you could apply this solution to so um, I would say uh, myself that uh, there are two areas that are key at the moment uh, healthcare because uh, we need to take uh, advantage of that crisis to maybe change uh, what we did. And uh, historically, Dream Park was working on healthcare. The second element is uh, sustainability, so low carbon transition. This is uh, something where we are already uh, engaged, but uh, for example, in agriculture, in uh, being able to use AI to be more efficient in terms of uh, energy production, 
areas that are really important for Europe, but for the world at that moment, at that specific moment. And we need to take uh, action right now to be able to deliver the results. Perfect. So this is a call for action. You've heard yes. it out there. Thanks well, a lot you. for being with us Thank together. You. Whoever wants to jump into the backstage virtual room to discuss further on or use the one-to-one -one meeting with our speakers. Now, before I'm introducing our next speaker, I would just give you an outreach to the last speaker, who is actually Itzik Ben Israel. He is advising the Israeli government for the AI strategy. So remain with us, we're gonna have a hot interview with him at the end. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Stuart Bashford, who is actually representing our Swiss use case from Bulon Group. Stuart is a digital officer at Bulor and is responsible for setting and delivering the company's digitalization strategy. He began his career at Bruder in 2013 in London, not in Switzerland though, as head of software and hardware development. As you can see, we're a global citizen. Prior to joining Bruder, he worked at a high-tech startup company for 10 years and also in the semiconductor industry for applied materials. He has an MBA, qualified and has a background in hardware and software design and a passion for technology and innovation. Stuart, thanks a lot for being with us. The virtual stage is all yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear. Okay, let me just share my screen. Perfect. Okay, I think you can. Uh, I think you can see the screen. So, I shall start. So, hello, my name is uh, Stuart Bashford. Um, very pleased to hear. Good morning, good afternoon, and whatever time zone you're in. Um, welcome to my sort of section on uh, creating business impact with data science. So, um, I'm the digital officer for the Bula Group. Um, and that means um, at Bula, we put everything into this sort of digital bucket. So this could be IoT, artificial intelligence, um, data analytics, blockchain, essentially all of these sort of buzzwords we've heard over the last few years. That kind of comes my way um, to do something with. And it's my job to set the vision um, and the strategy for, um, for the Bula Group with regards to these topics. Now, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of um, the Bula Group, but just to give a little brief introduction, because I think it's um, a little bit uh, helpful with the context for some of what I'm going to present. Um, I'll just give a, a little bit of an introduction, won't take long. Um, essentially, we're a, uh, a company with 160 year history, and we're family owned. We have a $3.3 billion um, turnover, um, fully worldwide operations all over the, all over the world. Um, most people know us for producing machinery that's used in the food processing um, industry. Um, we do also work in animal feed, but also in automotive. But 75% of our um, revenue comes from food industry. So um, that's what we're most known for. And that's what I'm going to focus the topics of uh, this presentation on today. Um, we are um, the, the, the family owners um, hold two things very sort of strong close to their minds. One is um, a commitment commitment to being a technology leader, which is great for me. I, I, I love the technology aspect of my job and being able to engage in data science and things like this. Uh, and you can see that reflected in our, you know, 5% of our revenue is, is uh, committed to R&D every single year. And the other thing that our, our family owners hold very dear to their hearts is, is, is sustainability. And they actually hold us equally um, accountable for our sustainability targets as uh, as they do for profit and and for good reason um, if we look at what's going on in the world right now um, every single year you can see that um, the human race uses and consumes 1.7 planets worth of um, resources every single year 
the day uh, at which we, we transfer from being sustainable and operating in a sort of uh, sustainable model to an unsustainable one. This is called Earth Overshoot Day. You can check it out on the, the links on the on the slide. Uh, this is nothing to do with Bula, but that'll help give you all the background information. But essentially, this this day last year in 2019, this occurred on the 1st of August. What that means is every every um, time you you eat some food, you drink some water, you use money, pretty much you do anything after that date, um, you're you're creating an ecological debt. You're essentially stealing resources from future generations. And um, the reason I bring this up is one, it's important to Bula, but secondly, um, I believe data science can play uh, a really important role in solving these um, in the important parts of these challenges. If we bring it a little bit closer to home, so this is now focusing on uh, at least closer to home for me in the food processing industry. Um, th this is the cost. Some of this might be new to you guys, but this is the cost of feeding the planet right now. So 25% of um, the world's global greenhouse gas emissions are produced from the agriculture industry. 71% of the water used is used by the agriculture industry, and a third of the global energy um, is consumed getting the food from fields to, uh, to the table. Now, that's consuming all those natural re uh, natural resources that we've just said has been so valuable. And yet somewhere along that way, we lose a third, lose or waste a third of that food before it even gets to the um, gets to the plate. Now, um, that's a big, big issue, um, obviously very, very wasteful. Um, and what uh, the, the biggest part of that that we have to deal with is that at the same time, 800 million people are um, starving. So this is clearly an unsustainable situation and something that we feel very strongly about within within the Buddha group. Um, and again, I think digital technologies can play a key role in um, being able to um, being able to solve these issues. Now, a bit more closer to home, let's talk about data science. So uh, this slide, next couple of slides, you're going to see some things that you'll, you will have seen before. I pretty much guarantee it. So, you know, we see these slides. 90 percent of all data has been created in the past two years. Um, and we know that even of that data, most of it isn't even used effectively. Uh, you know, I've heard stats that 90% of that data isn't used effectively within these organizations as well. Um, and then moving on to this, again, we've seen these types of pyramids and we all want to move from the, the bottom layer right up to the top and we want to get this wisdom and, and the insight that we get from and, and be able to derive these actionable insights. Um, but it's harder to do uh, in practice, and at least that's what we found in in the Buddha group. But what I'm what I'm going to go on to show you is a few practical examples of what we've already done. But if you put the effort in and you and you get it right, there's real benefits to be gained, and that's what I'm showing here. So you, what you're looking at is data we collected over a two-year period from one of our customer. Um, sites. Um, you're looking at three trend lines at the moment. The middle one, the light blue line, um, is actually showing it's the, the three lines are all tracking yield in a, in a flour mill. Um, the light blue line is interesting because this is one where we have monitored data. We provided this back to the customer and allowed him to use that to augment his processing decisions. And you can see the interesting thing is over the two years, you can see that we've managed to increase the yield on this one line where we're applying these techniques. Um, by 2%. Now to this customer, that's worth $300,000 a year. Now, the, the interesting thing here is, and I use this slide internally quite a lot just to illustrate the, the importance of data in this, this new kind of data-driven world that we're working in right now. Um, the, this, this to our customers is, is a number, you know, 300K is a number that they are very, very interested in. And the really interesting thing here is, this isn't data science. This is just collecting data, Packaging it, packaging it up in a in a visually appealing way that makes it easy and digestible for our customers to be able to use and make and make some use of in their processing lines. But it's not difficult. It's not it's not using any sophisticated techniques or anything. Just showing and visualizing the data allowed them to make more informed decisions on their process. And this accounted for the two percent yield. Now remember the sustainability issue we talked about. You know food waste, things like this. Now, yield directly contributes to that. So as I said, I use this internally to kind of drive a little bit of um, commitment and excitement and to, to build on the on the data science story that we have within Bula. We have a, an internal team within Bula, about five data scientists, and we supplement that with, with um, outside help as well, um, uh, consultant partners that we use um, around the world.
Now, in Bula, we, we have this team, um, five in-house people, but we supplement it with the, the external companies. But still, we have to make sure we use these resources properly. What you'll see on the screen won't go through this at all, but this, there's a whole range of areas where we could focus. Bula produces equipment that's used right the way from post-harvest all the way through to um, uh, packaging. Um, and and we also, that's our core business, but we also have um, do things outside of that as well. Now, um, key point is is focus. You know, you have to choose somewhere to focus, um, and that's um, and that's always a, a challenging part. But um, what I'd like to do now is just go through a couple of topics, a couple of things where we have indeed focused our our minds on a couple of things. And what you see here, this first first one, this is this is a, I mean, it's a product with the, that we sell, um, but. The important thing that I want to raise here is this is actually a subsection of, of a plant, an entire mill. They, this is probably maybe 5% of the entire mill. There could be hundreds of machines in, in this particular plant. Each machine could be measuring, again, hundreds of parameters. In our most sophisticated machines, it could be thousands, but for most, probably hundreds. And we can connect to every single one. So in this particular example here, we have access to somewhere around about one point, as the slide says, 1.7 billion observations every single day. Now, one of the challenges that we had historically was access to good quality data. You know, we had data scientists who were sitting there just waiting to do some data science, but we didn't have the data to be able to give them anything practical with. This this um, particular project we're looking at here solved that issue. You know, we had an enormous amount of data and high quality data, because the thing we get with this is uh, contextualized data. We get um, We get one parameter captured with every single other parameter in the plant and what that gives you is the context within which um, you can start to make some higher value insights to the data um, and that's something that we'd be very keen to get our data scientists involved in not least of which because it's a precursor to things like digital twins which we are, um, are actively working on at the moment Next project, um, going through these very quickly, I'll lead up to when I go into a little bit more of a deep dive on. Um, so this, this project uh, is something called GrainyGo. This allows us to be able to use advanced analytics techniques to be able to uh, predict um, the milling yield from, from just looking at um, a kernel of corn in this case. The use case would be a user would, would pick up a handful of corn, put it on the light box, as you see on the top right of the picture. And then we capture an image of that um, just using a smartphone. We send it up to uh, the Vula cloud where we um, analyze the data and return a report back to um, the user on the predicted yield. And what we're looking for here is we actually analyze the internal structure of the, of the grain. Um, we do some image analysis on that and then come up with a prediction model to be able to predict what the likely yield could be. Um, so this was done with using deep learning techniques and, and at the time this was, to be honest, it started out as a bit of an experiment from our part because we hadn't done anything with deep learning at the time, um, but you know, we got great results with it so we continued with it and this, this has now, this is a real product. Uh, in fact, the last two slides, these are, these are real things that you can buy and real exam practical examples of how we as an industrial company are managing to embed and implement advanced analytics techniques into our products. Um, now, the final one, I'll go into a little bit more detail on this one. So what you're looking at, the picture there is, is a machine, it's called an optical sorting machine. Um, and uh, this use case is all around coffee. Um, now, what this machine can do is optical sorters generally can measure a number of parameters, but what they um, typically do is measure color and or shape. We, we'll get to shape in a minute, we'll, we'll start with color. Now, what they can do is we could run something like 15 tons of rice an hour through this machine. So that's somewhere around about 300,000 individual grains of rice can be analyzed every single second. And what we can do with that is we don't just analyze every single grain of rice. We split a grain of rice into 100 different pixels and we analyze every single pixel for, for in this case, we're talking about color. So we're analyzing it for good or bad. If it's bad, we want to reject it. And we can do all of this at 15 tons an hour. Um, and if you ever get the opportunity to be able to see one of these machines in action, it's, it's definitely one of those machines that you look at it and you and you you actually can't believe it's even working. It's very very impressive. Now, the challenge I've just talked about color sorting. That's that's at the easier end. Now, shape sorting gets even more complicated. Uh, not only is it complement complicated to develop the solution, it, it turns out it's very complicated to actually configure and run the machine. And this was a challenge we had. This was the challenge that we had to solve. 
Um, so what uh, our approach to this was to engage, our, engage with our data scientists to see if there was a way that we could um, essentially come up with a rec recommender to be able to help set up the machine for a given sample size. Um, so what we would uh, basically do in this case is um, run um, uh, a training model. Let me just flip through to the next slide. Sorry. Um, we'd run a, a training model. Um, we'd run good data and bad data through a machine. We'd capture all of that data. Um, we would then use that to train the, the machine learning model, create the decision tree, and come up with what we're looking for is the three key influences uh, over the 27 possible features that you could have selected. We want to get that down to three from that particular sample batch. So what, what the way the use case would be is one batch of coffee could be very different from another batch of coffee. It will have different, slightly different anomalies, might have a different color, might have a different slight shape to it and things like this. And all of these things can be adapted on a per batch basis now that we have the machine learning algorithm in place. Um, and what would typically happen is we'd run the data through the model. This comes up with the decision tree, comes up with the, um, the feature report that we would then return to the customer. That gives them um, the opportunity to be able to update the machine to have the correct parameters. Um, and we have expanded this recently to allow this updating of the parameters to be done by our uh, service guys in the field. Now, one of the key drivers for Bula um, is actually to kind of democratize the use of data scientists throughout data science or cognitive technologies, uh, to use the phrase, um, uh, for everyone you know we still have the use of our, our, our you know our data scientists to do the very top level stuff but we want everyone to be able to take advantage of the data science so in this case our service guys can actually capture the data because they know how to do that um, run samples good and bad submit that into the, the web-based platform and then we can return the answers back to them what this means is that more more customers are using the um uh, the system and ones that may have been using it before but were using it ineffectively are now able to use the correct uh, the correct um, the correct features and analysis um, and then finally the outcome of that is what you see here is um, exactly what happens on the machine the left hand picture is um, is uh, a picture of what comes into the um, the machine and obviously we've got a range of different colors and we've got some stalks in there. We've, the middle picture is the accept. That's what comes out of the machine. I'll just remind you, that's probably around about 10, 10 tons an hour. So it's a very, very fast industrial process. And then on the right hand side, you've got what's been rejected. And what you, what you sort of clearly see there is that the, clearly it's taken out the stalks from the process, which was been done from the, the shape sorting algorithm set up from machine learning. Um, and you can also see some of the, the darker kernels which have been over roasted. Uh, as well as some small ones and some split kernels as well. So that's when taken out by the shape sorting. So um, essentially what I wanted to do with these examples is, <clears throat> I think it's very interesting to be able to show very, very real industrial examples um, of advanced analytics. We are committed to it as a company um, in, in the long term. We want to grow and enhance our, our ability to be able to do uh, data analytics. And I think you always have to think about delivering a real tangible benefit, either for your customer or for you, depending on your setup. Um, because ultimately, this is what drives more and more development. And I seriously believe that there's huge potential for these technologies in our company, but also to solve those global issues I started the, the presentation talking about in terms of um, uh, the climate change situation, but also the food waste. So. That was my last slide. Um, I, I hope it was um, interesting and gave you a little bit of an insight into what we're doing um, at Bula. Um, and with that, it's just left for me to say um, thank you and hand back to the moderator. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stuart. Thanks a lot for sharing all these insights from Bula. And I do have a question coming are the customers willing to share and to put their data into the cloud? Yeah, so this is a, I mean, we, we, we get this question quite a lot and, it, and, it, and it's funny, it goes through cycles. So about probably four years ago, we always got this question, you know, what, and we were wondering as well, we didn't know, quite know what the right answer was to this. And then it went quiet again, and then it 
picked up again. And just recently, this is just, we, we're not really getting this question quite so much anymore. And I think the key thing at, at this point really is um, what we see is when customers actually, when you engage with a customer at the right level, you have the discussion about what you're trying to do and they clearly understand what the benefit is to them. It's very interesting. Their, their question, their, all of their thoughts about storing data in the cloud or data security, these all kind of go away and they start thinking about what the value and benefit is to them and, they, and they're less concerned about their, their concerns about it being stored in the cloud. So that's, that's kind of one answer to that question. Um, but we do get the question and, and when we do get the question we we are open and honest with our customers um and ultimately what we say to them is you're in complete control we will only ever take the data that we need to be able to deliver you the service that that you want and at any time you don't want us to do that or take one parameter or whatever we will stop it's completely up to you you're in full control thanks a lot for this answer due to the short time thanks a lot no Whoever problem. Has more questions? Feel free to reach out to Stuart directly. I am sure you will be here also later this week if anyone want to discuss with you further details. Thanks Absolutely. a lot for our Swiss use case. And Thank you. Have a great evening. Now the last use case is coming from Israel. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Daniel Aronovich, the co-founder and CTO of Vocadis. He has over 10 years of experience in developing signal processing and machine learning algorithms. Daniel previously worked as a senior algorithm engineer in the IDF Intel and Microsoft R&D Center. He studied electrical engineering at the Technion in Haifa where he earned his bachelor and his MCs in electrical engineering completed the first year of his PhD in electrical engineering before co-founding Vocalis. The stage is all yours. Thanks for being with us, Daniel. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and I hope you are hearing me, hear me clearly. Uh, so uh, I'll be uh, discussing today how we use voice to monitor health at uh, Vocalis. Okay, so the question is, what's voice as a biomarker? That's, that's what we're claiming. And all of us are using our devices and we speak and use our voice quite a lot at home now with personal assistant. And voice is uh, non-invasive, passive in a sense, we're not asking anything from the user and it's scalable. And as I'm going to show you today, or at least try to convey you today, uh, voice also carries health information, right? And that's what we leverage uh, here in uh, Advocalis Health. So a little bit of history, because the panel, there was discussion about ecosystem and industry, academia. So actually, five years ago, I was one of the co-founders together with Dr. Shadi Hassan. You can see us together back then. I was a graduate student at the Technion in Israel and was doing electrical engineering. And actually I dropped out, I finished just one year and I co-founded the company. So in a sense, thankfully in Israel, there is a lot of strong, there is a strong uh, ecosystem and it's really something that a lot of people are doing I mean, in entrepreneurship. So I was quite lucky and this is from the end of last year, prior to COVID-19, when the whole company met. So uh, a lot of uh, thanks uh, to, the, to the great team, um, to what we achieved. I'm just presenting here. So what are the, our products? So today I'm gonna discuss the Vocalis Check. So it's eventually a screening tool, uh, an assessment for COVID-19, just using the voice, right? And, Today you can, as the best tool to do it is a temperature check, right? That's what most of uh, the companies and people are doing today. We have other products. You can see track. We can track patients with chronic uh, diseases at, at home. We have insight similar to the topic that was discussed pre previously about well-being. Uh, we can get some insight about the well-being of a person just from his voice. And there's the index product. Uh, it's a triage. So think of a scenario 
when there's a call center with nurses and they call each day to various patients with chronic disease at, at home so we can triage them because there's already a voice interaction and tell the, the nurse, okay, this is a patient you should pay attention to, he has a higher risk. So just a short one uh, presentation about the index. Um, so triage tool, which was actually uh, published this year, the publication. So what we did, we trained on 10,000 chronic patients, meaning we had their voice and their diseases and when they were hospitalized and 2,000 patients were used as a test set. And on the plot on your right, the x-axis is time. So it's one year has passed. Uh, and the y-axis is the probability to get hospitalized. So on the day zero, they have a voice recording of a patient and we can tell by the voice if it's gonna be in the group that has high probability to get hospitalized, right? So we can see the, the higher decile in blue and the lower decile in red. So this is a, an important tool to uh, triage, especially in the US when there's readmission cost. Patient get hospitalized and readmitted again after uh, some period, there's fines. This is irrelevant. Now I'll move on to uh, what we're actually working now, most of the company and, and a great effort is the biosecurity uh, use case, which is the Ocalis check. Uh, so the idea here is now we're using temperature, we as most of the countries, and the question is how can we be do better? Okay, so what will happen now and happening in various countries already, okay, the economy is going back, we are reopening it, people are going back to work slowly, and some uh, countries are already having a second wave. So the idea how we can do it in a better way, okay, to, to help and enable businesses and healthcare providers to go, go back uh, to being as normal as possible. Okay, and I'll We'll always be comparing us to a temperature check because this is what most people and companies are using now. And of course, temperature checks are less reliable, assuming you do the temperature check correctly and the, the hardware works well, still there's not uh, a lot of, uh, sorry, not a high sensitivity and specificity to the test, but also a lot of the patients, they are positive, but they don't experience fever. Right, so you miss a lot of patients. So this is like the problem we're trying to improve using the voice. And uh, how we do it, so eventually it's an app that you can download to your phone. We ask the user to count 50 to 70 or one to 20, depends. And actually we can run on free speech, uh, but in order to improve the user experience, we tell them to count. Otherwise people, I don't know, sometimes they want to tell, speak whatever you want and they don't know what to say. Then also there's an option to uh, ask a few questions, depends on the use case. And at the end, it's sent, the, the recording is sent to our backend and there's a risk assessment. Right? So you tell, you can see it here. Uh, on the left is the recording of counting, on the right is the result. You can tell if somebody has a high probability to be positive, medium, or low. Okay, and this is a way you can uh, screen uh, your population. So just to make this presentation more interesting, uh, um, we have a demo, right? So I'm gonna play some recordings of real people, and you try to guess who's positive with COVID-19 and who's negative just from the voice, right? So. Uh, uh, spoiler, it's not easy. Okay, so I hope you, you all hear the, uh, the sound. So this is the first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, good. And now I'm going to play the, the person on the right. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 
13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Good. So uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I have no idea uh, uh, if I would know who was the positive, but I'm going to tell you that's the person on the left, the beard is positive. The person on the right, even though he was counting slower, is negative. Okay, another uh, demo. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah, so it wasn't easy. You can hear that she wasn't counting uh, in an easy way. So now the lady on the right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah, so she also, to me, sounded uh, a little bit ill. And the right answer he, here is the lady on the right that's holding the smartphone. So she's positive, and the one on the left actually negative. And the idea here I try to convey is that uh, one of our features, uh, this check, that we can also detect asymptomatic patients, right? So not everyone. But some of them, they don't experience any symptoms and still we detect them through the voice. So this is a, an important thing that you cannot do, let's say with a temperature check or fever. Okay, so the next, you're gonna ask me how we're doing it. So I have one slide about more the technology. So if you can see on the left, there's a, a recording. We need 10 seconds. Again, it could free speech, counting, whatever. We uh, transform it into a, in, an image with a spectrogram, which eventually represents the frequency content of the recording throughout the time. And then because it's an image, we can leverage a lot of knowledge from computer vision and apply, in this case, convolutional neural networks that run on the spectrogram on the image, and then we get a, a vector of 512 uh, embedding. Okay, so each 10 seconds of speech uh, get compressed to 512 uh, embeddings, or you can think of them as features, right? And then you can apply some kind of a classifier, and uh, then you can do a, a binary problem, positive versus negative. You can see that the features, uh, the convolution neural networks are pre-trained, so we, we train them on, the, on our other databases that we have or other diseases. The architecture is an efficient net. And if you know, this is from gets the best state of the art in image net competition. And then we fine tune it on our uh, database of COVID-19. Our paper uh, that describes it more in depth are actually now in writing process. So I cannot say more than what you can see on this uh, uh, page. And how it works, well, this is a difficult question and I don't have a, a lot of time, but I'll just give you some uh, intuition that you can see here, an image of something falls on the floor at some point in time, you can see there's uh, something happens in this frequency content. And on the left, it's without noise, there's no background noise, so it's blue, everything before and after. And on the right, there's a lot of noise, but still because the time and the frequency are connected, especially uh, you can still detect that something happens. And similar, this is what a uh, convolution neural network is trying to do. Okay, so some kind of intuition why it works well. And just to uh, summarize, we are uh, now piloting our uh, product for Kalish Check throughout the world, actually, with healthcare providers, manufacturing, it is governments, remote patient monitoring. Uh, company. So if somebody is in Europe is interesting, uh, interested in collaborating, uh, you can reach me here. Also, I'll be at the backstage. Uh, and I thank you, everyone, for your time and wish everyone health. Our, uh, let's say, not easy situation. So thank you. Thank you a lot, Daniel. It was really interesting and I think this is definitely something
that will help us during the crisis and also in the future. One question that arise is, where do you get enough data, and I assume an anonymous data from? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, we a few months ago, we la launched an initiative on our website. You can donate your voice. It's under uh, an ethical committee, so you can do it. We, everything is uh, anonymized. This is one source. The second source, we run actually clinical trials in hospitals, record patients, uh, and we combine both of them in order to get a, a, a nice database. So my personal question will be now, I'll definitely gonna share my voice because I think we need to support with as much data we can. So whoever would like to join me, please Danny, share the link where we can subscribe. But what would I like to know now is, let's say I give my voice and you realize that I have COVID. What would be the process then? Are you allowed to share this information with me or are you only using this to actually trade the algorithm? So uh, currently it, it depends on the use case. We have pilots that uh, we plan to, to give it to the end user uh, and also his employer uh, will get the result. So uh, eventually similar to a temperature check, both sides would know what the answer is. But for now, the gathering initiative, we just gather. So if you go to our website and donate, just for gathering process. Thanks a lot. So let's follow what Simon, Morton, and Andy said during the panel. We need to collaborate. We need data. Follow me and share your voice so they can train their algorithm. Todaraba again to Israel. My Thank you very much. Hometown. It was and a pleasure. Talk to you later. Now we're reaching to the end and it is my great pleasure and especially my great honor that we were able to bring Itzik Ben Israel to stage to share with us insights from Israel about the maturity of AI and the strategy. Professor Itzik Ben Israel graduated from Tel Aviv University with a degree in mathematics, physics, and philosophy, earning his PhD already in 88. At least I was born then already, Itzik. He is a retired major general in the Israel Air Force and has served as a head of military R&D of the Israeli Defense Forces and the Ministry of Defense. He is a recipient of the Israeli Defense Award and the Israeli Air Force Award, and was a member of the Knesset from 2007 to 2009. He's currently head of the Blamantic Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Center and head of Yuval Neyman Workshop from Science, Technology, and Security at the Tel Aviv University. He's also the chairman of the Israeli Space Agency at the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Space. Now we will hear a short introduction from Itzik before it will be my honor to interview you. The virtual stage is all yours. Toda raba. Can I start speaking? Uh, uh, I hardly heard the introduction. I hope you hear me better than I hear you. Uh, okay, nevertheless, I will uh, talk in the next five minutes or so about the national AI project in Israel. As maybe some of you know, some 10 years ago in 2010, I was appointed by our prime minister to lead a kind of task force that submitted to the government a national plan how to make Israel one of the top five countries in the world in cybersecurity. Until that time, many countries dealt with cybersecurity, including Israel, for 30 years or so, but it was only done by secret services, intelligence services. Excuse me?
Now I hear myself again. I, okay. Should I, this, uh, I'm hearing myself now, but. If you, okay. Uh, so let me continue. Until that time, the uh, uh, cybersecurity was dealt all the, all, only within security and intelligence organizations. And what we did in 2010 is to take it in a way out of the closet. I was asked again by our prime minister two years ago, some two years ago, April 18, to uh, do the same and submit to the government a um, uh, national plan, how to make Israel uh, one of the top five countries in the world in artificial intelligence. Uh, with the same, with, with uh, um, uh, bearing in mind that we would like to benefit not only um, uh, to improve not only the, the security of Israel, but also the economy, industry, welfare of the society, etc. Now we did it uh, in the same methodology in three different axes. One X axis, one axis is naturally technology. When you say AI, what do you mean by AI? Usually people mean by AI either machine learning or uh, what we nowadays call data science that is dealing with big data or better the combination of both of them. Uh, uh, but when we thought about it, we have some 300 people working on it. When we thought about it, we decided to include not only those direct AI technologies like uh, data science and machine learning, uh, uh, neural networks, etc., but also other relevant technologies that may enhance the overall uh, of um, AI on the national level. One trivial example is the power of computation. All the ideas of AI were created in the 50s, 1950s, and the reason that uh, we only started to realize that it is possible and to see uh, uh, effective uh, applications only in the last five years or so is that power of computation was not enough until five, maybe 10 years ago. And therefore we, we, we decided for ourselves that power computation is also part of AI. And when I say power of computation, it's not only supercomputers or the cloud or things like this, but also more exotic technologies like uh, uh, com quantum computing. Uh, another example is, is IoT, Internet of Things. It will enable us, once we will have a lot of AI machines all over the country working, let's say in healthcare, uh, traffic lights, uh, um, transportation, etc. We will be able to, uh, uh, while those machines will work and improve our life, we will, if we will connect them or the sensors of those machines, to other sensors or uh, uh, national sensors, we will be enable those machines to be to improve, to learn from their experience while working. So at the end of the day, we found ourselves with a group of uh, seven, uh, six or seven different technologies, uh, like uh, machine learning and data science, IoT uh, sensors, autonomous systems, robots. Uh, um, and, and uh, computing power, etc. So this is one axis, technology. In each x axis, we uh, in each uh, different technology on this axis, for each one of them, we form the special team that will, uh, at the end of the day, submit a plan what to do in order to be able uh, uh, to develop the technologies in this area. Now there is a different axis in a way, uh, 
uh, orthogonal axis, which is the use cases. If, if uh, uh, technology by itself is, is not enough, like what you do here in this webinar, so, uh, and as it probably all of you really understand, um, uh, you can use AI almost in any field of life. Some people in Israel use it, for example, for uh, solving all problems about uh, 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 who wrote the Bible and how many people wrote it, etc. cetera. Uh, but you can apply it to, to any, any field of life. So we chose only a few. One, of course, is the natural one, and COVID-19 is only uh, demonstrating it, is healthcare. The second one is transportation. Uh, in Israel, like in many countries in the world, transportation is really controlled by computers. And if you take the traffic lights, for example, usually what we do today, we have cameras on, on junctions, and we move the, the jams usually from one junction to another junction, which is not good enough. If we will have an intelligent system doing it, we will be able to optimize the traffic or minimize the jams uh, uh, all over the, the city or the urban area, etc. Another uh, area is agriculture. And it, this, this point is worth a um, uh, little bit elaborating because we can't do agriculture, not because uh, usually you know Israel is, is investing a lot in uh, agricultural technology, but not, this was not the reason. The reason is that when we started to speak about national projects in healthcare, we found that technology is not really the problem there. The problem are other issues like privacy, People uh, who may be hurt uh, usually sue the hospitals, the doctors, the, the, uh, everything that they can, and they don't allow you to use the um, uh, private information in order, let's say you want to, to uh, uh, take a, a genetic um, uh, set of data and cross it with a, a clinical set of data, you need the, the uh, consent of the, um, of the patients and they don't, usually don't want to do it. And therefore we said to ourselves, okay, let's start by, be, by solving some diseases that are not human, but diseases of plants. That's how we came into agriculture. Uh, the, the, the algorithms, the, the DNA, et cetera, is more or less the same, uh, but Plants do not sue um, uh, anyone, and, and therefore agriculture was also added. Security defense is another field. So we chose certain fields in each team, each uh, field again on this axis, we had a, a separate uh, team. Uh, uh, and then we, we had also teams working on the, on the third, uh, axis, which is orthogonal to the first two. And this is about the uh, government and what government should do in order to encourage or to make and enable the uh, uh, technology development on that axis and the use cases on that axis to, to be realized, to, to come into uh, life. Uh, uh, the, we should deal with, with uh, issues like, uh, some of them were mentioned uh, here before, like regulation, budget, um, um, uh, ethics. We, by using AI on a national scale, we, we lose, knowingly, we lose some of our control on the machines. And there are many ethical questions which are involved here. Uh, 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 how to produce the uh, uh, number of people, educated people in AI that we need in order to make this revolution. In the cyber uh, former um, uh, plan, we uh, recommended, and this is the case now in the last 10 years or so in Israel, 
that we will add uh, cyber uh, um, to the curriculum of high schools. I'm not speaking about universities, but we added them to the curriculum of high schools. In Israel today, we still have this uh, old German system of what we call matriculation examinations. And if you want, the, the certain subjects are obligatory, and certain subjects you can choose from a very small list. One of the subjects in the list is cybersecurity. So we will do the same with AI. We will make it uh, um, an obligatory subject uh, in high school. Everyone will have at least one point, what we call the minimal um, uh, 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 number of hours to take uh, a studying AI. Of course, at the same at the university. So we speak about education. We speak about um, uh, training people. Uh, all these aspects should. Uh, uh, how do we? How do we manage? How do we encourage the industry to be effective in this area? As you know, uh, the, the government is not good at developing new technologies. This should be done by universities and, and industries, how do we uh, uh, find new mechanism that will encourage, like we, we did 10 years ago for cybersecurity, will encourage startups and, and, uh, and uh, 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 entrepreneurs coming from, from uh, bottom up to start working on AI and not other things. All these are on the third axis. Altogether, we had 15 uh, teams, and, and uh, we finished the work uh, a year ago, actually in June 19. But as some of you know, may know, uh, we didn't have a government there. The government that, uh, didn't succeed at the elections. And it is now more than a year that we didn't have a government, and we have something that we call continuation or interim government, but they cannot take decisions with new budget allocations. So we waited and we submitted the program only, only now uh, and these days. However, we did, it with these 300 people working, they came from all government agencies and offices and therefore, we don't expect any problem in, uh, in fast approval of the program. This is more or less what, what is happening now on the national level of uh, AI in Israel. Thank you very much, Toda Rabai Sik. It was very, very interesting. I took a lot of notes. And I'm happy now to start with the interview. In the meantime, we are also trying to collect your questions from the audience. I, I hardly everyone. hear you because I hear only myself. Uh, okay, hold on. With a delay. We will check this first. Just a second. I hear myself speaking uh, with a delay. Okay, it's probably better you hear me. I will, I will start with the first question. I hope, can you hear me, Itzik? Yes, now I hear you. Now you can hear me. Okay, so let's go on. You're helping also the Israeli government to design its AI strategy. Now, what are the most important prerequisites for a small country like Israel to be able to compete against large countries? What are what are the prerequisites, the most important prerequisites for a small country like Israel? Now again, I hear myself a few minutes ago. Okay. And it covers no voice. Okay, hold on. You can do more start. Hey, hey, can you hear us? I can hear you, but uh, now I hear you without the background. Now it's better. Okay, let's try again. This is like how tech lives and lives. So, um, 
My question was, what are the most important prerequisites for a small country like Israel to compete against large ones like the US or China? Okay. I hope I, I got, I heard you. Uh, uh, okay. Now, no, Israel, you know, has some 10 million people, 9 million people. Uh, you cannot compare us neither to the US nor to China. And, and, and the same question we asked ourselves uh, also 10 years ago when we decided to be one of the top countries in the world in cybersecurity. Uh, and and uh, cybersecurity proves, in a way, what we did in cybersecurity proves, in a way, that uh, uh, we can do some things in Israel that will enable us to compete with huge powers like China and the US. And the reasons are, are a little bit uh, complicated. First, um, uh, if I, uh, uh, Israel is very small. This is sometimes a disadvantage, sometimes it's a huge advantage because like we did cyber and we are now going to repeat in AI, we can in, in a few days meet everyone. I can talk when, when I was appointed by the prime minister, I uh, took the phone and called everyone in Israel coming from government, coming from universities, academy, coming from uh, people from industry, almost anyone who had to do something with AI and I, I asked them to come to a meeting and a uh, few um, dozens of people came at the beginning, then it, it expanded to 300. And we, in, 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 in a few months, we could uh, uh, prepare a plan, which we are going to submit to the government, that is coherent, covering not only technology, but technology, legal problems, um, psychology, uh, all aspects that without it, technology by itself will not uh, catch in a way, will not be developed. So this is a huge advantage. Now imagine yourself, let's say the president of the US would like to do something like this. I'm speaking about normal US with normal presidents, okay? Let's say he would like to do something like this. He will not be able to do it because the US is too big. He will have to speak with 50 different, let's say he would like to have, like uh, I, I mentioned now before, would like to have uh, this, only, only this aspect that, that uh, AI will be learned in high schools. He would have to talk with 50 different governors, 50 different local senates. Uh, uh, it will take all his life only to convince everyone because it's not a federal issue. On the other side, if you take China, if the president of China will tell to start teaching in high school uh, AI, it may be done in one day because this is China, but the uh, dark side of it, the negative side of it, that because in China the regime is as it is, uh, uh, the ideas that usually come on in Western countries from bottom up do not uh, come so fluently in China. I'll give you a numerical example. Uh, we, we started our project two years ago only to think about it before we started to implement it. Once it was announced by, announced by the prime minister, uh, young entrepreneurs started to form uh, startups, not waiting for the government to tell them. Uh, so if you, uh, uh, in 2018, I read the report, less than one year after we started, a report that counted all the uh, European report, counted all the startups, AI startups uh, on the globe, 40% of them were situated, were, were located in, in uh, the US, mainly around San Francisco, which is reasonable. On the second place was China with 11%, and on the third place was Israel with 10 and half percent. Only in absolute numbers, okay? We had almost the same number of startups in 2018, like China. If you go to the report, of 2019, a year later, 
we came to the second place with 20% of the overall startups globally. This is something that can be done in Israel, cannot be done in China. Great, okay, thanks a lot. Now, listening to what you just said, coming from yes. another small country like Switzerland, and we have some of them in Europe, we actually should be able to do this too. We're a small country, short way, a strong network. What do you think, what do we miss here in Europe? I had no, I had nothing of your question because I had myself again. Okay, sorry, I gonna repeat. Coming from a small country like Switzerland, and we do have some small countries in Europe in the size of Israel, hearing what you're saying, we actually supposed to be able also to do what Israel is doing. We have short ways, strong network, we're capable. Looking from a Swiss perspective, we even have a lot of money that we could invest. What do you think, what are the pitfalls? Why do we, why aren't we able to succeed the way that Israel is doing it? Well, uh, certain, I, uh, again, I heard only half of your question, but certain uh, states, certain countries in Europe, uh, I think may do more or less the same that we do. Uh, Switzerland is one example, okay? And you do similar things in other areas, not necessarily AI or, or cyber, but let's say uh, pharma or other areas. You, you, you are uh, one of the top countries in the world as, uh, uh, in this technology, okay? Uh, again, because you are small enough, developed enough, has uh, 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 this culture of uh, investing in R&D and things like this. Certain countries in Europe can do more or less the same. Still, some elements will, will are missing from uh, 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 those countries in, in uh, Europe. And I'll give you one example. Uh, some of them cannot be really copied, some elements. Uh, uh, in Israel, as you know, we have uh, like, I mean, by the way, we, we copied the system from Switzerland, some 70 years ago. We have a compulsory service uh, uh, for everyone. In Israel, it's boys as well as, as girls. But it's a long service, three years, not a, a few months, three years. And we take 1% of uh, every cohort. Every, I mean, the cohort is all those graduates of high school, age 18. We take 1%. We send them first to study, we delay the, the, the service and send them to study uh, usually uh, um, science or engineering. And then after they uh, graduated from the university, they have to serve as any other uh, citizen of Israel for three years. And even two years more because because the, uh, they were accepted to this program. You take one percent every year, and you do it for seventy years. Then, after uh, seventy years, at least one percent of the population will have a degree in sciences and engineering. Actually, in Israel, it's one and a half. In every other Western country, I don't know the exact numbers, for example, for Switzerland, but I guess that the number of citizens of Swiss, uh, uh, Switzerland that have a degree, university degree, in uh, sciences or engineering is, is like the, uh, more or less the rest of the Western world, which is around uh, half a percent, sometimes 0.7 percent. In Israel, we have one and 0.5%. It's two times bigger relative to our size than in other countries because of this military uh, uh, um, uh, mechanism. Now, after five years, those engineers and, and scientists that practiced 
on the uh, work in, in the uh, defense, uh, leaving the defense and going to industry. And then they come with ideas and, and, and um, uh, set up funds, uh, new uh, uh, startups, etc. And that's why we have all those huge number of startups uh, in Israel. Uh, so this element cannot uh, copy by almost anyone in, in, in Europe. But some of the other things I think can be copied and can be uh, studied. Uh, the lessons can be uh, studied um, uh, from our experience. Thanks a lot. Now I'm going to ask my last question because time is already late. How do you see Israel fitting into the global race of next generation technology? Uh, how is Israel? How does Israel fit into the global race of the next? generation of technology where do you see i I, I i didn't hear, hear the full uh, if if you be silent for half a minute and my, the voice i hear in the background will disappear yes uh, maybe you can repeat it and then i will understand for what you asked me for sure the question was how do you see israel fit into this global race of the next generation technology. What how can Israel fit do what? The, fit, how does Israel fit in this global race for new for the next generation of technology? If you speak about technology generally, uh, you see technology is a very, very large term. Uh, uh, in global terms today, we play a huge role in technology which is related to computers. It's not, it's not a, for example, pharma or, or car manufacturing or something like this. But if you speak an, on, uh, about technology in the sense of computer related technology, Israel now is a huge player. I mean, I give you a few numbers uh, last year. 2019, the, the export of Israeli cyber technology, as one example, was something like 20, more than 20%, almost 24% of, of the global market. And this is a huge number. We are a very small country. We are 50% of the market. Uh, a year before, it was a little bit more than 10%. Uh, I hope I heard the question uh, uh, rightly. I don't know if th this was the question. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we do have a challenge with technology. We do have it also here once again. Thanks a lot, Itzik, for being with us, giving this very, very interesting insight. I think Europe can learn so much from Israel, collaborate a lot with you, and Therefore, thanks a lot back to Israel. Have a great, great evening. And I hope we will have some more discussions in the future. With this, I also want to tell you, I just had a glance of some comments. I will try to resume it and send it to you. It's a, there's a lot of encouraging and supporting comments from all over the world. Thanks to the audience. It's always strange to speak to an audience you don't see. At least I read a few of the chats. Thanks for the support, for the encouraging words, especially having this tech not working always, standing in front of a camera, not really being able to do anything about that. It is strange, but we're working on that. And as mentioned at the beginning, we're going to have the, second, the next one on the 22nd of June We'll send out the invitation. We will post it on our social media. If you do have great use cases you would like to share, if you have insights you think it's good others to know about, come back to us. This is a call for speakers, a call for 
use cases all over the globe. Let's share that. Let's share the experience. Let's make it big. Stay healthy. And we will talk to you in a few weeks. It was great to have you all with us. Have a Writing's great evening, not that easy. a great but afternoon, really can help. or a great <laughs> morning, wherever you are. Thanks you a lot. Why wait? Seconds. Act now and share for success.